S D P P P The Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts, Steve Dangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. You are never, ever, ever gonna beat the Oilers by scoring two goals. What what did I say? You're never gonna do it. Last show, I said you gotta score like five goals. Yeah. Five would have got it done. Five would have got it. Five would <laughs> you know what? Four would have got it done. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the, the empty, empty netter, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, and you're you know right. what's funny is that as soon as that uh, Bertuzzi... Uh, oh, would he hit the post? In the first day, I'm like, that's going to... I knew it. I'm like, that's going to bite him. That's going to uh, bite him. I, I just too... It's too leafy. Now, I want to run you through... Like, listen, I understand there's a lot of people upset. Fire Keefe and PK Subban's like, fire the coach. And Biz he is like... That? Yeah, he he said that in like November and then retweeted the video this morning. Oh, and wow. then and oh, then yeah. Biz actually said something I really agree with, which is they should have got Zadorov. I would take it a step further that whatever was on the table for Tanev and Zadorov, they should have probably done. But let's not talk about defense. Let's not talk about goaltending. I want to just quickly chat about the stat and then we can get to it. Over their 11 game win streak, Jesse, Steve, how many goals per game have the Oilers scored? 11 games, 11 wins. How many goals have they scored in 11 games? I have no, I can't answer this question. <laughs> I know. I know roughly. I'm going to say they scored 52. Okay, now, Jesse, just give me your rough answer. Over the 11 games? Yeah. Uh, it's about 41. 44. There you go. Oh, which wow. means they have scored four. An even four goals per game. Wow. Now, the schedule. Yeah. What's the least <laughs> amount of goals they have scored in that time? Meaning what game did they score the least amount and still win? They uh, I know the last Montreal game was 2-1 over yeah. the weekend. So. And there was a Blackhawks game that was also 2-1. Two, two, one. One. two goals is the least amount. So the, how many goals did the least score last night? Two. <laughs> oh, my God. You're not going to beat the Oilers scoring two goals. You're just not. You're not. It's not going to happen. Now, I don't want to make excuses. We can talk about the defense. We can talk about the goaltending. We can talk about the keeping. But end of story. You cannot win against the Oilers if you do not score at least five goals right now. And would it be a huge deal if this wasn't four straight? No. It wouldn't be a huge deal if no. it wasn't four straight. But they've blown a lead again for the fourth straight game. Mm -hmm. A multi-goal lead for the third time in four games and it would be a third period lead in four straight games had they not simply blown a two goal lead to the Islanders in the second period instead of the third. So this breakdown, gentlemen, will not be about necessarily the game itself. It will be about the trend. Mm. It's a bad trend. It's a bad trend. And it's weird that there's any pushback against that. I, think I don't think there is. The, oh, yeah? Want to bet? The goal scoring thing, I think, is is a really important point because a lot of people are ranking on the defense and they're saying, oh, everybody's out of position and that sort of stuff. And the defense isn't good enough. Go get Zadorov. But Sheldon Keefe focused on the offense in his postgame. And I feel like if there's just a little bit more offense, they can cover up a lot of these defensive problems. And he pointed to Nylander hitting a, a crossbar, Bertuzzi having a, a puck that's over on a wide open net and it just hits the post and doesn't go in. And if they're able to just finish better, these problems, you probably don't lose four games in a row. But I don't know where their finishing ability went. Like Nylander, who spent the, the entire bank. first part of the season being an unbelievable finisher and scoring the most amount of points he's ever scored, can't do it anymore. Signed a deal. Yeah. Well, no, stop it. <laughs> he Let's signed a deal. No. Why, I why should I stop timing. it? You wanted the money. This is what comes with the money. But the money Score. is not... No. Score. No, the money doesn't Four start until games. next Score. year. Money doesn't start till next yeah. year, Steve. Oh, well then fucking... Sorry, he's fuck still it. making $6.9 million. 69. Nice. Well, then... Well, what a, blaze it. what a little teacher's pet overachiever he's been then. Yeah, he's been great. Oh, great. I think he's one of the best. Can't wait for next year right when now. he just tears shit it's up. Not next if this year, though, is, is how it? he performs at his less than $7 million rate, how's he going to be at 11 and a half? I Jesse, bet he's going to get 153 yeah. what's points. The, uh, what's the, uh, what date is it today? Today is January 17th, 2024. And, and in 2024, uh, like what, what hockey season are we in? The what? It's a, it's a it, year split. It's the 150. Fifth season. No, of the it's, NHL. The, it's the 23 24 season. So has William Nylander's money kicked in yet? No. Yes. No. So I will not hear it. I will not hear it. I will not hear it. Eight years. I will not hear it. I'm happy for Willie for eight years. I'm concerned about some other things. Like he made some good moves. I thought, like, uh, I thought 
Uh, his little move where he spun around and almost put a top shelf and it went off the goalie's head like Stuart Skinner got his ear in it. Uh, could have been a goal. It was great. Superstar. Not worried about the money. Not worried about that money. You ought to be. Um, it's... <laughs> I think it's, it's why the steam. Stays. It's actually the 106th season of play of the NHL. Is it? That was a year off. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yes. So this is about the trend. The trend is giving up leads. The trend is the team's bad defensively. Now we have had for the last two, three years, if I'm not mistaken, coming into this year, uh, the defensive metrics for the Leafs drastically improved. There oh, were they're really, really good. Uh, and and let's be honest, uh, the the signings this summer on the defensive end of the of the puck were mixed. <laughs> Every John, signing was mixed. John Klingberg was never going to give you great defensive minutes. So if you were expecting that, like, yeah, no, uh, I hope that's what, not what true living was expecting. Um, Simon Benoit has been better than we expected, but he shouldn't be playing with Morgan Riley near the end of the game. Right. Bridge too far. Well, can I, can I stop on Klingberg for a sec? Of course. Cause okay. We, we have this conversation um, when a team, is going after a player, the trade deadline, free agency, whatever, and then they miss out on them. Well, then you can't just, or very often they don't just go, well, then we'll get no one. They go out and they get that person light. They go out and they get their silver medal. They go get Tim Connolly. Yeah. <laughs> you remember That's, Brad Richards and Tim Connolly? It's anyone? a very notorious one, but yeah. And Tim was not great. It, no, he was not. Um, no, he was not. But, uh, you go out there and you get John Klingberg because mm -hmm. you're like, this is what we need. We have these killers up front, killers, and we need someone to get them the puck. They got to get them the puck. And then Klingberg, his pelvis explodes. Yeah. And that happens in sports. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. It's a shame. He wrecked that pelv. Yeah. He wrecked that pelv. Yeah. Did he... <laughs> You just get out there and crush pelvis. You dude? just crush pelvis. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. So, so uncomfortable. Uh huh. But you go out there and and who's he been replaced with? Uh, well, that's the thing. No, I have an answer. Who is it? Simone Benoit. That's who's like there was a rost. There is a roster spot now because that player is hurt. Yeah, and he was replaced with Simone Benoit. Now, Benoit has been pretty good. Didn't look great on the game-winning goal last night, but he, he's been fine. That doesn't fit the vision they had for this team in the summer at all. No, it doesn't. At all. So what's going on there, mm -hmm. Brad? What's going on there, Shani? On account of, I'm going to remind everyone, Shani, up at the top for over a decade now, Shani. Makes the calls. Makes the calls, Shani. This team, like Sheldon Keefe, very obviously cannot fucking stand the team that he has to coach every night. It's pretty obvious. He put the team 13th forward from last week on the top line. And he's actually looked okay. And he's looked fine. Yeah. Except yeah. for on the game winning goal. New Hyman. That's Pont Pontus Holmberg. Oh, for fuck. <laughs> yeah, I thought Can't wait till he goes to Edmonton then. <laughs> I thought Holmberg was like holding his own. Yeah, like, I in think that he's position. doing He's been good. Yeah, yeah he's, he's been, been fine. No, but he's been fine. what I'm saying though is like before the preseason, I had no idea this player even played wing. Mm -hmm. Like he just, he's supposed to be center. And I guess it's easy to go from center to wing. <laughs> I don't want to get caught up on Pontus Holmberg. He really does not like this team. You have, you commit to David Camp for four years. Why do you have David sure. Camp? You have David Camp to center your fourth line? Well, yeah. no, you have to David Shut down Camp. center. Is David Camp, Camp who, who by the way, center. walked Darnell Nurse last night, which oh, was, right. which was a Darnell good Nurse can't pivot. So. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it was fun to see David Camp walk down, coming up the boards and just go right around him. Yeah. It was nice. Yeah, good, Listen, good for him. Whatever. Like, you're <laughs> wow, putting two, him. Two bad contracts going head to head. Yeah. Win. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, my God. Nurse has to thank his lucky stars. He's on the Oilers. Oh, That's maybe. the worst contract in the NHL. Yeah, it's bad. Him and Cal McCarr, just oh. like neck and neck in contract. Value. I know. Does he make wild. more? I think he makes more. Is it more? It's eight I, two five, isn't it? He's nine two five or nine and a quarter. Makar is nine flat. I thought. Okay, Darnell let's was triple eight. check this. Uh, where is Edmonton and Colorado? Let's bring up Colorado. I'm Plus almost one. positive. Anyway, I, if he's not in the if he's in the nines, it's worse than I ever thought. Yeah, Makar is yeah. nine. 
Okay. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Nurse is Darnell Nurse nine two five. Bar none. Bar none. The worst contract. Two hundred and fifty grand that. ahead of Easily. Kale McCaw. Handily the worst contract in the NHL. Oh, Who's boy. worse? You're right. Who's worse? I can't. can't Who's worse? He puts up points me. on the Oilers. Mm -hmm. Okay, like call up any AHL defenseman and put him in the same position as Nurse. Yeah, yep. he'll do fine. Yep. Till twenty thirty. Till it's a fucking nightmare. It's it's. Good Lord, looking at that gives me heart palpitations. All right. And he might win the Stanley Cup. Who would you rather have? What? Nurse at 925 or Makar at 9? <laughs> nurse. You know what? Nurse, nurse he's taller. Like a challenge. <laughs> Sometimes you have to create adversity to get to your goals, you know? <laughs> it's I, I'm, This is turning into a LinkedIn post. Sometimes you just have to pee your own pants in public. <laughs> Like <laughs> here, here. Going back to David Sheldon Keefe. Sheldon Keefe hates this lineup. Is yes, the point you're trying to make? Yes, sorry, sorry, but Steve. he's right too because Treliving goes. We're gonna get John Klingberg to get to do John Klingberg things, and he's for all his warts, he's gonna put up 50, 60 points. Oh, he's hurt. Okay, replace him with a guy who has one. Now, is it fair what? to say that because they just moved people up the lineup? Yeah. Oh wait. wait oh, wait. okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, right. we're gonna sign David Kampf. Mm -hmm. $10 million. The new Matt Martin. Four, two and a half times four <laughs> equals 10. All right. Which means we're going to trade him for a no name goalie and then he's going to play fine. But you signed shut down center David Kampf to play him with who? Two random men. I love Bobby McMahon. Mm -hmm. It's not a shutdown line player. I think he's fine. I like him on this team. It's not a shutdown line player. And. For God's sake, we've seen enough of Noah Gregor that he's not that player either. So you're playing your shutdown center with two random men. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and we're wondering why he's having everybody's focusing on comp. Like, why is he having an off year? Yeah. Like, well, well, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so then ice your third line. Oh well, you don't trust them. So ice your second line. Oh well, you don't trust them. So ice your first line. Oh well, you're trying to trust them last night, and they cost you the game. Like, do, do you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I get you. This Frankenstein friggin' design of the team. Mm -hmm. Like, they had a vision for it. The vision was immediately bad. And they're <laughs> plugging all these gaps that don't make sense. And, and who got moved up in the lineup for Klingberg? Well, it's like uh, Giordano or, if you depending upon you, how you look at it, Lilligren. No! Or, they're okay. on the third pair! It's Benoit! Oh, Benoit. Oh, you mean, yeah. Klingberg! was with McKay. I don't think it's it, Benoit. I don't think it's like a direct replacement for Klingberg is the point that Adam was trying to make. I think it's been a mismatch of, of Legacy and McCabe and 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 Benoit. Uh, Every, who? Everybody's kind of been be over, nice the, over, the course, over the course of the months that Klingberg yeah. has been out. They've been using all of these different friends because Gio's been out for a while now yeah. and then now he's been back for a few weeks. So it's it's been a it's been a committee of defensemen that they've just been trying to trot out there. Yeah. Lagason Lagason's on milk cartons right now. I have no idea where that guy is um they, they won't use him and yeah his well, last game was december 27th they'll use timmons who who is I, objectively terrible you can't use him you can't use him well if you, you can't use him in that role like if you want a klingberg type player you could go with that fella but you don't want that thing that you want what are you doing what are you doing i wonder if they're they're just choosing Timmins over legs and because he shoots right. Oh well, man, it could come down to that. Yeah, it could. Timmons, you might like be right. Timmins is a right shot. The lineup last night, so I'm I'm getting caught up here. Yeah, Timmins is a right shot. Legs is a left shot. Like like several like Max Domi. Okay, he's brought some intensity to the lineup. Keith has trusted him a little bit more recently, but look at his ice time. He doesn't trust this player. Mm -hmm. Like all these. All these conversations that we heard this summer, Brad Living had hours and hours of it's it's like uh, him and Keith were the Joker and Batman with a bunch of pizzas in an interrogation room talking this thing over. They don't seem to be on the same page at all, mm -hmm. even the, the slightest. The reference was seventeen hour meeting that they had over the course of seventeen two days. hours. Yeah. And like, hours. I don't like the job Keith. I don't even done. think anybody can stay awake that long. No, that, first of all, I don't believe that. what over the course of a couple days over the that's not a 17 hour meeting. Yeah, 
So Unless had, it started at six and no, then went to six no, a.m. or whatever. That's two eight-hour meetings or an eight-hour meeting and a nine-hour meeting. That's hey. not a. That's not a seventeen-hour. Hey, that's hour how it was phrased. That's like it's what like they, working they all to week and saying you had a forty-hour <laughs> shift. <laughs> David, they're just trying to David Goggins. If you don't meet super hard, yeah, then you, you know, I don't even know. Fuck anyway, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, know. I don't know where you're going, going, going there. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that it's like okay, you okay, so you met. Let's say they met for seventeen hours, and that's true, and I don't believe it. If they did, what did you do? They, they don't seem to be on the same page at all. I don't like the job Keith has done recently, but I feel like firing him right now, which a lot of people want, only exacerbates the problem. Just, oh, yeah, just so people don't, don't think I make this shit up. And as the days ticked by while the GM spoke to the lease players and staff members about Keith and exhaustedly grinded through 17 hours worth of meetings with Keith himself, all the vacant head coaching jobs in the league gradually got gobbled up. That was from Luke Fox on June 29th, then June 29th, 2023. So there you go. I I, I, like, I don't think that. <laughs> here's the thing. I I uh, I did read a tweet last night, and I think it was from Alex Hobbs. And he's like, listen, in no other sport, doesn't matter how good the coach was. In no other sport would a coach with successive first round and out, uh, although they, he didn't have successive first round and out because he did have a second round and out in there. Uh, no coach would have survived that. Yeah. But he, but again, he didn't, he didn't have this, this past spring, he didn't have a first round and out. They did get to the second round. So no, if this is any real franchise, the head coach lost his job by now. Yeah. And, and I don't think, I don't even think I, I I'm of the opinion that I don't really think he's the problem. I think that they have a Franken team and I agree with you, Steve. I think what, well, here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing an unexpected regression in TJ Brody. And it's been, I know he wasn't great in the playoffs last year, but he was steady for three seasons heading into last year's playoffs. Oh, yeah. I, and and yeah. this, he is drowning. He is drowning out there. Yeah. Mark Giordano, we saw what happened to him in the playoffs last year too because he was exhausted. I don't think the plan for him to, was to be in the top four or play this many penalty kill minutes. Like I'm looking at Will Lagason's, uh, uh ice time and it's like, Ah, fifteen minutes, twelve minutes, eleven minutes when he plays for the for the Leafs, right? Fine, that's a that's a third pair defense. That's what Giordano should be. Yeah, that's what he needs to stay as. And and then you've got Simo Benoit, who is a big body, who does big body guy stuff. Don't mind him. Uh, I actually have always liked Jake McCabe. I think there are warts to his game, but yeah. you're paying him two million bucks. I don't really think there's a problem. Big hit. Morgan Riley's time. an absolute beast. Lilligren's looked good since coming back, but you don't have the depth on this defense, and they are certainly not capable of playing whatever system the Leafs are trying to force them to play. That is also, I think, important an important point. Like, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are talking about, like, Nick Robertson being in, uh, as Jeff Merrick likes to put it, Lachey Bow Wow um, in the doghouse there with uh, <laughs> Sheldon Keefe. Um, what's Lilligren got to do to get off that third pair? I don't know. I you, thought he's looked good, man. Dude, I, you can't look at this lineup and tell me he deserves that. Like, I'm not saying healthy scratch, Brody. I don't think things are maybe that extreme. Um, it's time to take away some responsibilities, for God's sake. Like, put him on the third pair. See how Lilligren does at very least. It's like how we we talked last episode. The true true coaches set you up for success. Yeah. Okay. I know what this player used to be. And there's, here's where NHL coaches get blinded, and I don't blame them, is... Players' skills do diminish. And sometimes they come back, but sometimes they diminish. And they this, this player is not capable of playing the same role as last year. You have to recognize that. So you must find somebody else. Not right now. Like, maybe it comes back. I don't know. And, and then, so the question is, well, then who steps in and plays TJ Brody's role? <laughs> and that is a true living Shanahan question. Because it's not, there is nothing internally that is going to substitute for that. Yeah, well, it's a question that we have an answer to. Uh, well, we don't want to give up on the prospects we have or the picks that we have, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have any cap space, so we're just going to sit here. And whose fault is that? Brendan Shanahan. Thank Thank you. I think I you got you got to both at the at the end of the day, like at some point, we need to start blaming the actual people who put together this roster and decided to keep doubling down on the thing you hate most is yeah. giving these core four the money, and they've done this for eight years now. Well, like. <laughs> Like, we make fun of Dubas for loving his guys. And he does. He loves his guys. And he had a type. And so here's here's what you have, right? Mm -hmm. You have your core four. Mm -hmm. Morgan Riley, core five. Whatever. Core five. Fine. What are you, What is your job every year? You got to find some goaltending, 
some adequate goaltending. Yep. He was very, he was literally hit and miss. I'm great at finding a starter. I am bottom five in the league at finding a backup. Mm-hmm. And we're finding a starter who's like peaks for a season and then you got to get rid of him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and like making a mistake with Mrazic and then we fall over ourselves to praise him for getting out of his own mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, finding Jack Campbell in a deal where Jack Campbell was the throw in with Muzzin. Yes. But also yeah, what if what if Jack Campbell had just not been included in that deal? What would they have done? They well, it he wasn't. Rough. No, 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 no. Sorry, you're getting confused. Muzzin was a separate trade, and then I think it was a year later they made a trade with the Kings. It was uh, Campbell and Clifford for picks and Trevor Moore. Right. Oh. <gasps> right. So Trevor Moore. So, yeah, there great. were two separate deals with the Kings. But yes. Yes. You're right. He had a type, and it was un. Okay. You you got to fill your team. You try to get your goalies, and then. His type was undersized guys with good underlying numbers who couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. Like every game, you're like, but the deserve to win, they can't shoot. They cannot shoot or pass the puck. Yeah, Patan, Maligan, who else you want to include? Him? Just cardio merchants, like just getting out there and hopping on the Peloton and <laughs> I'm in the Scottish Highlands today mm-hmm. and maybe tomorrow <laughs> I'll visit Morocco. <laughs> Like just, I like the Austria ride. The Austria ride. Yeah, you know. All right, everyone, give give me a little push. Lift your little weights that you also get at the side. Like, and then you got to add in always finding a guy who plays perfectly with Matthews and Marner, and then not being able to keep them. Well, and then he would hit. Like I'm making it sound like he never hit. He <laughs> no, he hit, hit, and then and he they can't were keep gone. Them. Yeah, gone, mm-hmm. dude. The only Hyman, reason they were able to keep bunting is because he had a two year deal. Yes. Two year deal and like turn down money to come to Toronto because he's not stupid. He got great advice from whoever was giving him advice. Go to Toronto. They'll use you because you're cheap. You'll put up a 40 billion points and provide something on that team that no one else on that roster, no one is willing to provide Mm -hmm. and then cash out. That's why Bertuzzi and Domi are here right now. Yes. For the bunting route of this. And they have 10 goals combined. Ah, well, like, Michael, so, Michael's got nine. Oh, lovely. Oh, well, then great. Great. Yes. And like, so your point is about the Dubas roster. So so Dubas had his faults, but he that was how he tried to fill out the rest of the roster. Brad Treliving <laughs> has filled out the rest of this roster. Like a kid paying for candy and coins. What can I get for? <laughs> And uh, this one is, is this 25? It's a nickel. It's okay. Five. And then it pennies. I don't even know where I got this. They stopped making them. And what the age is random men. The roster's full of random men. There's no rhyme or reason or theme or identity to the team. We want snot. Okay. Man, like they do play with more snot. Yeah, but what that I think what that comes down to of Bradshaw living walking into the Circle K and being like, "Hey, what can I get for all of these dimes and quarters that were in my pocket?" Yes, comes down to Brendan Shanahan on his way down to the Gardener, deciding, "Hey, I didn't like Cal Dubas' press conference. I'm gonna can my GM as we're in this turning moment in our franchise five where, weeks before the draft, where I can I can move some of these pieces because Willie's contract is coming up. Mitch Marner's no trade clock c- kicks in on July." first and we need a roster overhaul because we just got whooped by Florida mm-hmm. and all of a sudden getting rid of the guy who knew the roster the best and was probably willing to make some moves because he knew that his job is on the line if this thing doesn't keep if this thing keeps going the way it is but no Brendan decided to get rid of that guy and bring in a guy a couple weeks out of free agency who didn't know the roster completely and just has to go get a bunch of guys yeah, and we're gonna sit on our prospects and we're gonna sit on our pit no the core you're spending a billion dollars on is in their prime now. Now. What are you doing, you madman? So you're telling me you're going to hold on to all this shit and develop these guys until they're too old to compete anymore? Well, no. What I th- did you talk about in those 17 hours? I was thinking about this. I was thinking about mm-hmm. this. And I think that if you are the Leafs right now and you say you're open for business... What do they? What's Fridge always say? They're gonna throw you an anchor, not a anchor. lifeline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're saying, nah, I won't do it. Nah, I won't do it. They'll do it. 
they'll do it because you because the uh, the the logic that you so eloquently put out there is true. You have to you have to win now. This is the time to win. And so so you know you got your first round pick next year. You don't have what that one this year. Um, you've got what you've got in terms of your prospects. You're probably uh, the Leafs are going to have to trade off the roster here. This is going it is going to happen. Yeah, um, like Sam Lafferty. Well, yeah. listen, I agreed, and that was that was a really bad move, and and it just goes to show how quickly this stuff can fall apart. And it, well, he made way too much. Oh, sorry, he made one point one five. What are we doing? Yeah, yeah, I agree. The what are we awful, doing? Awful, awful trade. It was and like. We need guys who play with snot. Sam Laverty. Mm -hmm. But they had to sign Ryan Reeves, and like that's that they had to make cap room for Ryan Reeves. There's another know. guy in a milk carton. Is he is like is he still hurt, or are they so, just not playing him? Uh, when they list the practice practice lines, I can't say practice. Um, they list him as the extras. Oh, so God I assume sake. like he can do stuff, but he's would, not in the line. Is he in a gray jersey? I don't even know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not there. Imagine, but, to be honest, yeah. I don't think that that factors too much, yeah. other than the money that he's taking up. And I think, you know, I think we all agree. Like when Klingberg was signed, when we did our little free agency show here, we were like, that seems odd. And like Dumba was still in the market. Dumba signed for the same money. You know, like I think, and I understand it's July 1st. Well, wait till July 2nd when Dumba signed or <laughs> July 3rd when Dumba signed. Like get him, get, get your guy at his money. And I think, I think all of that's true. So then we, then we go to the Mitch Marner quote mm -hmm. and the Mitch Marner quote oh. has been the thing that people have been railing on today. And essentially what he said, and here's the part because that bugs people me about don't this like quote. him. What bugs me about this quote and the way it's being put out there is he starts it with, obviously, we're pissed off. That's how he starts it. Yes. And that part is not being tweeted. Mm -hmm. That part is not being reported. Mm -hmm. That part is not being clipped and thrown around the internet. Mm -hmm. I think it changes the tenor of the quote because the rest of the quote is essentially, and I'm paraphrasing. Do you want me to play it? it? Yeah, it. play it for yeah. me. Okay. Don't let anything outside of us frustrate us or get us you know, angry. Like, Just got to do what we do. Do you feel frustration seeping in? No, but I think, you know, a lot of people on the outside are trying to do that. So that's how it goes um, for us. You know, we know we're doing right things. Don't let anything so, outside so, of us. Hey, wait, wait. Hold so he also says at one point, you know, we've been playing some awesome hockey. That's the part that people are like, whoa. Mm -hmm. we, I, he says we have we had a couple leads in all of those games. Yes. We've been playing great. Yes. Now, it's Mitch. not the Stanley Cup of we sometimes play well. Right. It is. Right. Um, and so. Uh, I understand what Mitch Marner is doing. Remember, this guy wears an assistant captain's jersey. Yeah. Um, and you can disagree with the... With I think the, the refs love that, too. Uh, I, I think that you can you can dislike the way he handled this, and you could say he should have handled it differently. But I think the part that has been cut off time and time again, which is him saying, obviously, we're pissed off, changes the rest of the sentence afterwards. And I'm not no. trying to be an apologist here. Because I actually do agree with him. I do think they've played some awesome hockey. I have seen things from this team that I did not see from last year's team, which was supposedly the best team of the Dubas era. Mm -hmm. Last year's team always mm -hmm. played down to their opponent and always played up to their opponent. This, this year, I've actually seen the Leafs come in, dominate, start to finish. I never, ever, ever saw that before. However, pretty rare. However, yep. they've been really streaky. You've got John Tavares, who is last in, I think it's expected goals. Like his, sorry, his goals not scored, but expected. I don't even know how to articulate it. Uh, the I, goals I know he is expected to score based on how he's playing, he's last among He's last, yeah. meaning that he's he due for a regression to the mean. He should have been scoring more goals based on his play. Which Bert we talked about last episode. Bertuzzi, wide open net, and it goes off the three inches. Yeah. The three inches, the three inch piece of metal. You know what? The no tape on the stick is less cute when you only have six goals. Okay, fair. <laughs> tape your fucking stick. Yeah, uh, it doesn't do anything. But I, I don't, I, I don't care what anyone says. Tape on your stick doesn't do shit. Um, I think, I think at the end of the day, you've got a team here that is very imperfect. <laughs> Uh, I don't think they're as bad as they're being made out to be. I think uh, uh, you got a head coach who's frustrated with his line combinations, which is why he's made some of the most perplexing line decisions that we have seen yeah. in the last week, right? Yeah. We've seen he's frustrated. Remember, too, where we are in the season. This is January. This is the time for going, let's try it. Mm -hmm. They are going to make the playoffs. We're pretty sure about that. They are going to play the Panthers Who's and the we? Bruins. Who We're the pretty sure about that. I am. They might be out of a spot by the end of the week. 
And it's January. Yeah. There's time. Oh. There's still there's still a lot of runway to the season. And to what Adam's saying, Sheldon Keefe came out of the post game and he was talking about the offense and all that stuff. But when they're asking him about the losing, he said, okay, so the trend has been eight days. Like we've been on a four game losing streak. It's been eight days of this trend of losing because before that they we had good. a dominant road trip in California. Yeah. The Leafs are so fixated on the message and not nearly focused enough on the product. Like they're okay. I don't disagree with that. At all. Yeah. Everyone is, is so, we need to calm it down. It's been eight to, you lost four straight and blown four leads. Don't gaslight us, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, like, I, 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 that's here counter argument. That's like 10% of the season so far, four games. That's like 10% of the season. Oh, based on the 42 they've played. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, so Steve. So you've been dog ass and blowing it for ten percent of the. I do, the the Mitch Marner quote is bad for the optics. You know, it's like, bad for the optics. It, but it, again, it's it's being misreported. It's not fair. No, it's not. And it, it is being misreported. Play it again. You have to have Play it that. Again. Wasn't the we full get, quote. We can get the full one. Give me a second. Uh, that was not the full quote. It's not being reported out there. And to be honest with you, you know the 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 thing about the Leafs right now is that he they need to be saying what he said. He said the quiet part loud. Was that in the room? All of what he said is what he should be saying to his teammates. He's a leader in the room, right? We Fair? make too much money, right? Oh, it's, what it's, you, it's, what you no, he said that no, louder. no. Oh, okay. what he did say. Here, you want it with the obviously we're pissed play, off. Play it? it with everything. All right, here's the whole thing. What's your sense of frustration with the leads getting in these last few games? Um, obviously pissed off about it, but um, like I said, I mean, all these games we've been playing, we played some really good hockey. Um, you know, we've um just given it back. I've had a lot of chances to extend leads in games and haven't done a good job of that. And, um, you know, I thought you know, we played pretty good defensively again tonight, but, um, you know, just a little slip up there, here and there. And they got a lot of skill that can make things happen. And he's right. Wait, where was the rest of it? That's, that's the quote. And then the next one, the other one comes from a different question. This is the, the first one. Right. You want it again? Well, no, I would like the other answer. Which, because no, the other answer is important to that answer. Okay. Cause the, yeah, they're separate questions. Like that's yes. the thing. Everybody's mishmashing the whole thing, but he comes but. across like Rick James, like, <laughs> you know, come on. I, I didn't mush my boots into Dave or what was it? Eddie Murphy's couch. Come on. I got more sense than that. Yeah. I remember grinding my feet in that man's couch. Like obviously you were pissed off about it and blah, blah, blah. No, nah, everything's going to be fine. I, Mitch, I think, which is it? So, but that's where I didn't get to finish my point. Mm -hmm. That's the quiet part. You say that if the, for a team that's so focused on 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 the messaging, they are really bad at delivering a message. And what Mitch Marner needs to do there is is be very generic about it because that's what you need to do. To the public you say we need to be more accountable. That starts with me. Boom, move on. Quote over. Everybody goes, "Okay." But what he did was he said to you what he's telling his teammates. And what you need to do when you're in a losing streak in life is focus on the little victories. Did we play a good period here? Yeah, we fucking lost the game, but uh, okay, we got we to, gotta, that, what we did in that period, that's what we need to focus on, right? And continually build on those things. It's a streak. It's a losing streak. I believe that they'll be fine. I think most people believe they'll be fine. Are they as good as last year? I don't know. But I think you look at this and you go, Mitch, after a loss like that, Public doesn't mm -hmm. want to hear this. No. What the public wants to hear is that we're on it. We we recognize it. We're pissed about it. And the accountability starts with the leadership group. That's all the public wants to hear. Tell them what they want. Give the people what they want. So a team, so I agree with you. The team is too focused on the messaging and they're bad at it. Yeah, <laughs> Message terrible. better. Someone Message, needs to have a conversation. If they'd with said that, that today, people would be like, I'm glad Mitch Martyr's stepping up. Yes. You're so fucking right. Or Tavares ever once. Yeah. And you know what? I, That's, I love I've him, saying, but listen, I've been come saying, on. I've been saying for more than a year now that I think Tavares' time as a captain is coming to an end. And it's not because he's not a good player. It's because we need to see results. And in Toronto, you need a little bit more of a vocal leader. What we had under the Matt Sundin era, Matt's hated interviews, never said much, but you had Darcy Tucker. You had Gary Roberts. You had Brian McCabe. You had guys that were going to talk to the media and be like, you know, well, what, or Ty Domi even was great with the media. Yeah. Fantastic at handling it, a post-game interview, especially after a shitty loss. I need to see Austin. Mm -hmm. I don't need to see the second line center who's on pace for 70 points. 
And I'm sorry to say that that's John Tavares. And and I and and the and he is somebody I do want to talk about eventually. I do think that it's it's we're getting near time where Austin needs to take his team now. Mm-hmm. It's Austin's team. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, or Morgan's team. Give it to Morgan. Um, whatever. Uh, he never screws up the messaging and I think what we need these guys to do is to just even if you don't fucking believe it. Don't pour gasoline on the fire. No. You step out and you go, it's on us. We will solve it. Here's some here's a frustration that may not seem fair that I think a lot of Leaf fans Life isn't have. fair. So go ahead. Yeah. I f- I feel this frustration. The Leafs are going to be what? Uh the Leafs are going to be what? Fine. I think that I think that they will figure this out. Yes. Yeah, but they're going to be fine. Well, fine in the meantime. I actually, I, man, I'm a lot more positive on this team, I think, than most people no, are right now. I like this team. 13.25, 11.5, 11, 10.9. That's no. not fine. 6.9. Oh, stop. Right it's, now. It's yeah. not, that is not a core where I look, you don't look at that murderer's row and go, oh, yeah, this is fine. Ah, sorry, you got absolutely. No move clause, endorsement deals, the salary, the bonuses. I am sorry you got exactly what you asked for and you now wear this crown of thorns. You are a star. That is what the money is for. Perform or no one's going to feel bad for you. And I don't feel bad. And this I'm not saying I feel bad. I... Listen, th- this team, the expectation every year with that with those salaries is not fine. Mm-hmm. The expectation every year is, you know, even if you're not the favorite, eh, this team might fuck around and win the cup. That's not the discussion. We're talking about second round. Ah, uh, you know, uh, they might make the play. And and like people are going, ah, uh, you know, it, you never know. They could do like a Florida run. Oh, that's not how did Florida get to the cup final last year? Bobrovsky, Bobrovsky, and also beating the dog shit out of anyone who came in their path. This team's not capable of either of those things. Mm -hmm. What are you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the strategy's blind luck. I think the strategy's blind luck. The fuck? I think when you look at this, is it's that they, um, I, I, here's the thing. The Nylander thing is the Nylander thing. You have to keep Nylander. You do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am. I will listen to people who are like, you got to figure out the Tavares thing next year. I'll listen to people who are like, Marner's got a year left. Maybe you go to him. And I, I'll listen to that. I will great, totally listen to that. Thing about I also, I think have it's, to do it's important to keep in mind that Klingberg's money's off the books. Uh, Sammy's money's off the books. Guy Brody's him. money's guy off the him. books. What? No, so you... you, you <laughs> Adam, continue your point. Go ahead. Uh, well... Uh, is that true? Is it not true that they are their money? No, he the said book. new guy signed him. He was just he was digging digs at Bradshaw Living. Oh, oh yeah, it, like, it was. It, oh, it's I unnecessary. See what you're I didn't understand. I was like, what? yeah, no, no. sorry, I didn't hear it. I dude, dude who spent the money in a fucked up way is going to have more money next summer. Forgive me if yeah. I'm not excited for I, that. And, and I yeah. get that. I get that. I think here's the thing: if it was Treliving that was driving those decisions, he's now lost power, which is a good thing because it, we've all forgotten. Months. I think what we've all forgotten here: you got to let the GM come in and do his thing. All of the people. That surrounded Kyle Dubas. Mm -hmm. So when we say Kyle Dubas, what do we mean? We don't just mean Kyle. We mean all of the people he hired. Mm -hmm. With the exception of Jason Spezza, who was a junior member of that staff. Yes. All of them are still here. I think they're all employees with a boss. Well, and I I think that now Brad swung and missed a few times. And and, and maybe Shani too. Like, again, I I will listen to that, that Shani's a big part of this. Uh, Maybe it's time to listen to your staff again. Mm -hmm. And I think... They, I like the direction that they've gone with a tougher team. Toronto wants a tougher team. I don't care that mathematically, yeah. mathematically, this is what the way it works best. Uh, we saw six years of that, and they didn't make the second round, and nobody wants to hear that shit anymore. Torontonians want a team that will beat you up every once in a while. They do. So give them that. Mm-hmm. They have a team full of superstars that can score goals. Mm-hmm. Give it, you gave them that. Mm-hmm. What you need now, and what, we, what we've said for a while, is you need to overhaul the defense. And they've said that they want, they've talked about overhauling the defense. What Zadorov got traded to Vancouver for, go look it up. It's embarrassing. Oh. I cannot believe they let that deal go. Can't believe it. The other thing I want to talk about with last night is Martin Jones, who Martin was Jones spectacular. Was 
Yeah. It was spectacular. So but the goal, stunk. <laughs> the goal that Dry Seidel scored is the Martin Jones that'll kill you. So, sub NHL. That is, how are you cheating away from your post? Everybody, listen. Uh, I know that I know that average people like myself are not a, ever allowed to challenge goaltenders on their decision making. Yes, we are. It's not that fucking complicated. Everybody makes goaltending seem like you need a doctorate. No, it's not that hard. Get it's not that fucking hard. Get fucking well, real. It's Get hard, but it's not complicated. And stand yeah. up. Stand up. Martin Jones, one of the things that he's been called out for is positioning. The other one is going down too soon. He could not even see the shooter. So stand up. You know where the angle is. When you go down, you've let the whole the whole top end and, and Leon Dreisel was lethal with that backhand. It's one of uh it's one of Joseph Wool's greatest strengths. He stands up. He uh he f- finds his way through screens. Um Sammy, when he was struggling, like a lot of the emphasis was on his wild movements back and forth. Holy shit, he couldn't find his way through a screen. Mm-hmm. And when your defense stinks, uh, you got to fight your way through screens. Last year, remember he had the best high danger save percentage in the NHL? Yeah. First of all, it was probably unsustainable. But one reason why it might have worked is they played better in front of him. Agreed. And they took a step backward and ooh. They don't have the talent there anymore. And I think that what's really hurting them is TJ Brody falling off the way he has. I don't know what's going on with TJ Brody, but he has... I mean, uh, for all the criticisms of Marner up front... Uh, TJ Brody deserves all of them on the back end. Well, he's, he is drowning, that's drowning the, out there. And the coach. So, you know, it, well, it is the coach because he's putting him in spots, mm-hmm. but I also think the coach would probably tell you if he was here and he could talk about it openly. He'd be like, put who there? Who right. should I put there? With, I don't with, know. The, Give it a shot, man. With the Martin Brody, Jones thing. Brody, the, uh, sorry, Benoit Riley. Was that not giving it a shot? Yeah, for a second. And with the Martin Jones things, I think it's unfair to criticize your third string goalie who has two shutouts in 15 games and a 922. I think I can for letting, a play. For letting in one bad goal. Like, like there's, a, there's a little bit of leeway for your third string. But you know what? I, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess. But you're the starter now. He's been fantastic. And he was great last night. Yeah, and he was great. Besides was. one play. I think, I think there's so many other pieces of the lineup you can criticize. Okay, so let me ask you Martin this then, guys. Here's what concerns me the most about the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I love this player. When they play a fast team, John Tavares is a non-factor. And we saw it with Colorado, with the one good line Colorado really has. Mm -hmm. That line is unbelievable. And we saw it with the Edmonton Oilers. The Leafs are slow. Uh, I don't know if Leaf fans have realized it, but they've been slow for like four years. Tavares, against guys like that, can't compete. That's now, why we look see, at, that's why we see guys like Noah Gregor and we go, ooh, and ignore the fact that he's just not a very good player. You look at you look at the way John Tavares played in the playoffs last year. He had, some, he had a, I mean, he had an overtime winner to send them to the second round. Amazing. It was awesome. But there were times where you're like, ooh. And my biggest fear, you're worried about the contract situation. I'm worried about it for a different reason. I'm worried about it because I don't think that... This guy's your second line center long term. And I said it last episode, who's coming in to replace Austin? And you don't have the money to do it. And I'm worried about if they run into a fast team in the playoffs, somebody who can outskate them, that first line will be fine. So wait. Nylander will be fine. But you've put Bertuzzi and Tavares, two objectively, and now these guys are great skaters by average terms, but in the NHL terms, they're not. Detroit fans will tell you. They're not great skate. Bertuzzi is a what somebody explained him. He's like he's like a bit of a Zamboni out there. Is that somebody explained it? And I was like, yeah, kind of. He just kind of slides around. He he tries so hard, but when he's not scoring, if you squint, he's just Mike Pizzetta. Like, mm-hmm. do you know who that is? Yes, I know Michael Pizzetta. Yeah, a lot of people listening are like, hmm. Yeah, he's like a. I also like an auxiliary player on the Habs. I also think they could. Maybe, you know, this is a guy they need to work. They need him to work this year. Yeah. Uh, he was a beast in Boston on their first power play unit. He's not seeing the, he's not seeing those, those things. His Maybe buddies. Get him going. Yeah. I like, so, and here's something frustrating about what you just said. The two team, if the Leafs do make the playoffs. Sure. The two teams they are most likely to face are who? Uh, Boston or Florida. Are they tougher than Florida? No. Are they tougher than Boston? No. Are you faster than Florida? No. Are you faster than Boston? I don't think so. What are you good at? 
You're, you're not tougher. You're not faster. You're Austin you Matthews. You suck. You're Austin Matthews. You're Austin. Your identity is a dude. Well. Your identity is one guy. That's not good enough. The fuck? Like, like uh, that, that clip producer Drew put up yesterday that made the rounds. Like, I, I think at worst, Matthews is still like a top five player in the world. At worst, mm -hmm. right? You know, I was just talking about McDavid, who had 153 friggin' points last year, and over 60 goals, by the way, and Nathan McKinnon. Comparing them to those guys. But, like, even the Avs struggle to win games sure. these days. Yeah. Like, they, yeah, because they've got one good line. They got one good line and, like, maybe the most elite defense pair in the world. One good line. They have a goalie who is fine. Yeah. He's a middle of the pack starting goalie who's on pace to start 67 games. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah, it's bad. So they got they got issues. It's bad. Like it But they're facing all these injuries and Landeskog is he's he's coming back. Who's injured up front for Toronto? Who's injured up front? Who's missing? Nobody. This is the team as designed. Mhm. Mm and they're not faster and they're not tougher. Well, they they're, are tougher. The Leafs are tougher than they used to be. No, no, no. They're not faster than their opponents. Fair enough. I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Like, it's okay that they're tougher than they were, but they're still not faster than their opponents. Or sorry, they're still not tougher than their opponents. Or sorry, both. Um, if you had the speed and you had upgraded your toughness and you're not quite as tough as your opponents, but you're like Tampa. Tampa wasn't tougher than their opponents, but they were tough enough to stand up for themselves. And if they are able to stand up for themselves, every other weapon that they have takes care of it. Mm -hmm. Right. The Leafs don't have any of those things. They have several good men and they have a star <laughs> player. Well, Tampa has got a star player who might kill you. Might kill like you. Kucherov when he loses it. He could kill someone like that guy is crazy. And He's a fourth crazy. line that usually the fourth line is supposed to be, oh, th there they go. Attack, attack. Get that. Get get your line out. And Tampa would regularly ice this line where you go, ah, oh, fuck. It's them again. Mm -hmm. Belmar, Maroon, Perry. They've had their struggles this year, too. Mm -hmm. Like the whole team. Yeah, well, none of those. Oh, yeah. I was going to say none of those guys are there anymore. No, Belmar no. might be. No, I mean Tampa generally. You know, those, some of those guys are gone. Oh, yeah. Well, and they've been... It's one thing when you build this m monolith and over the centuries it crumbles into the sea. The Leafs made a snowman and it has, it melted in the spring. You know, it's just not the same. I hate that, but it's good. Hey, are you gearing up for a dry January? It, yeah. Yeah. Well, Temperate Spirits, available in Edmonton, is a great place to get your uh, non-alcoholic beers, mocktails, and wines, all available on their website. You can explore a world where alcohol doesn't have to be involved, but you can still be, right? Mm -hmm. It can still be tasty. Absolutely. Now, listen, uh, you can start your year with clarity and focus and keep your New Year's resolutions while exploring great new tastes. Temperate Spirits ensures fast local delivery straight to your doorstep. You don't even have to step out in a fridge in Edmonton winter. <laughs> it's, it's not like it's cold there or anything. Yeah, no, no not no. at all. Now, I do want to say this. It is only available in Edmonton. We are hoping for them that this is available countrywide. But right now, you can do it in Edmonton only. Temperance-spirits.com. So it's temperance-spirits.com. Uh, and if you use dry Jan 24, D-R-Y-J-A-N-2-4, you can get 20% off of your purchase. That's residents of Edmonton uh, only. And at Temperance Spirits on Instagram and Facebook if you would like to find them. Enjoy. With Mitch Marner, um, do you think there's any avenue to him accepting a different place to play hockey yeah. yes do you think Absolutely. he i i feel like there's budding sentiment in the leafs community that he would be open to playing somewhere else. i i feel like i feel like mitch would be open to playing somewhere else does he look like a guy having a great time no no i'm sure he's sick of this shit yeah and and like and i, I get it and he too. might go somewhere else and just be unbelievable yeah because yeah. i get well, it I mean, his, his childhood dream and everything but like maybe you reach the point and you're like i can do this somewhere else where it's a little more quiet you know in in my hot ticket palooza i said uh it's okay to be optimistic well jesse here's here's uh here's the opposite take for you <laughs> childhood dreams die 
We saw Matt Duchesne, who was able to tell you the exact make and model of every stick of every member of the Colorado Avalanche that he grew up watching and loving. Mm -hmm. And then one of his childhood idols became his head coach and told him, hey, you kind of stink. And it didn't go well. And he huffed and puffed and blew his house down and demanded a trade. And the avalanche instantly got better. And the Sens instantly got worse. And he pinged around the NHL until finally landing in a situation that made some sense for him in, in Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't so bad in that. He likes guitars. He loves gu <laughs> Fuck, I didn't know that Does about he like him. country music? I need another feature about how much he loves guitars. He loves them. No, I, why was that a talking point for like five years? Because hockey players are tremendously uninteresting. <laughs> Generally speaking. Yeah. Like, there are some guys who can spin a yarn. We're going to have one of them on later in the show. Um, but f does he love guitars? Mm -hmm. He loves them. I think I think it'd be an interesting conversation between Brad Living and Mitch Marner if he approached him and said, hey, if I found a destination you like, uh, would you be willing to go there? Well, it's completely up to Mitch, mm -hmm. as was decided by the president of this hockey team. It wasn't. He it wasn't always, up until last July 1st. Yep. Yeah. It's... <laughs> Hey, we can trade this marquee player to wherever we want. There are 31 potential buyers. And now there's... I, how many, Mitch? Mm -hmm. How many? It's, Three to five. Sorry, I don't know why I'm looking into the camera. He ignores all the noise that he brings up at every opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stop looking at me. Like, I... I... I said in the LFR yesterday, I I think the people around this guy are doing him a tremendous disservice because I take a man at his word. He says he's blocking out all the noise. I think he's legitimately trying to block out all the noise. And I think he has people around him who keep sending him the noise. Oh, yeah. And they got to stop. Yep. Yep. I would. I, I almost 100 percent positive on that. It, it, do you remember the first time we had Elliot Freeman on? Yeah. Years and years ago in your apartment. Mm -hmm. and he came to my apartment yeah which is wild to think in it's retrospect. wild yeah. <laughs> and what was he doing there <laughs> i don't know a, a surprising roster of people visited your Merrick, apartment. justin Bourne, justin Bourne, james Jeff, Bernal. <laughs> dude richard petty richard petty went CEO to your of mlsc hot as fuck nothing but windows apartment yeah like <laughs> yeah you must have hated it there in the air you love a ice well, box the air conditioning uh unit was undersized so yeah in the summertime it would get up to like fahrenheit like 90 degrees oh my good yeah. lord it was terrible Adam. that's absolutely ridiculous anyway yeah friedman talked about this player and he wouldn't name him mm. uh but this player was like oh i heard you said this and blah 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 and he goes well who told you that Oh, well, and it was like the guy's like uncle wife or uncle or it's someone in his family or someone in his group mm -hmm. kept sending him all this bullshit. And it was like out of context and purple monkey dishwasher and, uh, uh you know, broken telephone <coughs> and it wasn't doing the player any favors. And then he's like, well, here's what I actually said. And it patched up you know, his relationship with that player, whatever, whatever. And that player was able to screw his head on tight. Dude, you are not doing your friend. If if I know people in pro hockey listen to the show, I promise you, you're not doing your friends any favors. Or if you're a player, your friends are not doing you any favors by sending you the shit that other people say. Mm -hmm. Like, I, mm -hmm. I think it's healthy. I'm not saying don't hold me accountable for my words. By all means, please do it. Plenty of people do. But if you're truly blocking out the noise... Why is it still so fucking loud? It, it's are, are you surrounding yourself with people who are helping you achieve your goal? Well, my goal is to win. No, no, no. Let's look at the micro things. I'm blocking out the noise. Okay, here's some noise for you. Well, that's not helping you. Your friends are actively working against you by doing that. Best of intentions, they probably don't realize they're doing that. But they're doing that. Tell them to fucking stop. It's not just Mitch. It's like there's lots of players out there like that. Mm -hmm. Lots of players, family members with not very subtle burners out there. 
Um, yeah, you can almost pick them out sometimes. It's a little embarrassing. Yeah. Oh, it's humiliating. Like you're, you're like, oh, okay, I yeah. know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen, there's been several where like, yeah, we know. Well, and like, <laughs> like someone, someone, so that, that clip, I do, I do have to address one comment. The, that clip went out there yesterday about uh, me talking about Austin Matthews not stacking up to McKinnon and yeah, but that was that okay. was Drew taking it out of context and trolling you. He wasn't really taking it out of context. I mean, he. I mean, he loves this. I mean, he could upload the full episode and then you'd get the full context, right? But yeah. you know, it's it's a clip. And someone was like, "I can't believe this guy gets to talk to Austin Matthews um, despite talking all this crap." Here's a little advice for like young media professionals out there. Your job is not to be a jock sniffer. You're also, you don't get to talk to Austin Matthews. Hi, Austin. Hi, I'm a good little boy. And I just want to shake your hand. Gosh, it's so wonderful to be in your presence. What? That's not my job. And Adam, I do sometimes yeah. get to be in the same. Oh, you, you talked to him the last like three, three uh, years yeah, I, in I, Henderson. I, uh, I In Henderson, Nevada. Yeah. Uh, yes, Jesse. I talked to him at the uh, the player media tour. Okay. And I don't know if he likes me. I don't know if he hates me. Doesn't but he matter. greeted me with a, it. First of all, it doesn't it does, matter. It you're doesn't absolutely matter. right. You're, you're a journalist in, the, in, the, in that setting. In that setting, yes. yes. And a journalist who asked, like, do you believe in aliens? And, and, and shit like that. And when you <laughs> were you know, in, I'm not like a capital J journalist. But, when you were in Sweden, you, you were in the locker room. You yeah, asked the guys questions. Yeah, like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, in those settings, you're a reporter. You're like, you're asking questions. It doesn't matter if they like you or not. Yes. And like, I've said, like, dude, he's been a Leaf since 2016. I've said plenty of good things about him i've said plenty of bad things about him when that uh thing that happened in arizona with the security person mm -hmm. like wh what do you think we were like oh that's great that he did that no we criticized him and we hammered him and we hammered his agent and his dad and guess what i've met his parents mm -hmm. i've uh met his uh other family members i've met a bunch of family members of the leafs who have come up to me and whatever and none of them were like hey fuck you yeah i, I don't think that that one Tweeter was correct about their comments. So no, I, know. I don't know if they need to be addressed fully. What I am <laughs> saying is they've been nothing but professional because they get the gig. They understand what they're doing here. They understand their role as stars. Like I will always give Matthews credit for that. Anytime I've met Marner shakes my hand, Steve, I go, Mitch, Morgan Riley and I have spoken to each other for probably over a decade now or the better part of a decade. Mm -hmm. um, like the, these guys, they get it. Mm -hmm. They get it. it. It's, you know, and that's me saying good and saying bad. They understand that they got to take their lumps sometimes. That's part of the reason they, you know, look like a ashamed dog. Sometimes they step in front of the camera after a loss because they're like, well, I got to take my lumps. Mm -hmm. You know, that's they know nice. how they played. It sucks. Yeah, it sucks. No one knows better than them how they played. Honestly, what do you uh, know how <laughs> fast aware of it. this industry dies? If if every time uh, they lose, you just go, ah, it's fine. It's fine. Well, well certain rights holders do that, but yeah, I, and I it's, think it's not true it's because not you true. can't just keep yeah. losing. You can't go zero and eighty two and it's fine. Like yeah. if anybody's doing that, they're lying to you. The I've, <laughs> I've been to lots of hockey games. And every time the home team gets scored on, there aren't droves of people going, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not, all right. It's not true. <laughs> don't worry. It's fun. I paid $300 to watch you go down three, nothing in the first period. And I'm okay with it. Don't worry. Go team. Weirdly, that doesn't happen. I've never seen it. Can I throw out another team to kind of put a cap on this? Please. The Los Angeles Kings, um, if for, for all like how bad the Leafs have been, we, we think the Leafs have been the last, last four games, they've been bad, but like overall, it's been kind of okay. Los Angeles Kings in the last 18 games are five, eight, and five. I'm dying. They have yet to win back to back games in this calendar year. Wow. Uh, December 27th, the last time they won back to back games. Are back to two wins in a row. I should say not back to back games. Two wins in a row. They haven't won this calendar year. Um, of, of their five, eight, and five record, two of those wins come against the San Jose Sharks. So sounds a lot like another team. I know. <laughs> but I think there's there's a lot of struggling there from a very good team. If you were to put the Leafs and the Los Angeles Kings in a seven game series right now, who's favorite favorite? Oh God, I don't know. 
I'm probably, probably taking the Kings. I would take the Kings. I would probably take the Kings. Well, especially with the way Dano shut Matthews well, down. And yeah, the, the and Leafs it's, are dying up the middle right now, and the Kings might be the strongest team up the middle. Yeah, and you see a team like that who on paper is so good and they're struggling. The outlook on them is they'll get it together. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the Kings, j just to add to the who would win the Kings of the Leafs, the Kings have two centers on their roster right now who have beaten Austin Matthews in a playoff series. So the Kings. Yeah. yeah it would be the Kings. Deneau and you're Sorry. like, who's the other one? Dubois. Play in series. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Play but if you put into context who's had the worst last 18 games, it's yep. definitely the Kings. And and this is So where... there, are, there are ups and downs to NHL seasons. Yes. I agree. Mm -hmm. But... Yes, we but there's a lot of butt that we just discussed for an hour. Yeah, yeah. and and I no, think, <laughs> I want to do it again. We just did it for an hour, and that was the that's the butt to their ups and downs. Since we're on the Kings for a sec, yeah, can I just take a moment? There was a tweet that went viral. Okay, where um, they didn't get enough players in the All Star game. I don't know if they got one or zero. Um, they got at least one. Because yeah. Gary said, I don't want a reason for anybody to turn off the All-Star game. So everybody gets a representative. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. That's his quote. Oh, well, so it was. Um, and then their Twitter account goes, well, we're not a Canadian team. Oh, yeah. I did and that. then had the balls to be like, oh, Leaf fans have found this tweet. What, what does that mean? <laughs> Explain the joke. You're not a Canadian team. What is it? What is that? Popular? You're not popular. Okay. Got it. Mm hmm. That's all. Um, I uh, <laughs> stop it. Um, That's I think, mean. I think uh, it's true. Uh, listen, every it's team's got their it's problems. True. It's January. This is the time to figure it out. Toronto Maple Leafs need to figure some stuff out. And uh, and on we move because uh, I believe they're playing again tomorrow night anyway. So Calgary, Calgary, and they're playing double this weekend. Adam's former home. Hey, by the way, what are you doing on Saturday? Uh, oh, <laughs> I was like, what? Kingston Sunday. <laughs> I'm streaming on SGPN's page. Let's go. I'm doing a side cast, whatever you call it. Obviously, we can't show you the game. But if you want uh, me to do this loud, screamy energy thing. It's not like that the whole time. Live. No, not the whole down. time. You talk. Depends on the game. Mm hmm. I've I've had game sevens where I was up there the whole time. Sure. sure. It's called okay. adrenaline, baby. Um, but yeah, Leafs, Canucks. Uh, it's a marquee matchup. Oh, man, is it ever. Two huge teams in this country. Are they popular? Yeah, well, they have an unfair advantage. <laughs> Imagine being upset that a bunch of Canadian teams got their players in in a Canadian All-Star game. You play in a state mm -hmm. as big as this country. Yeah, I know. <laughs> stop, Can't get stop. more than one player in the All-Star game. Stop. Stink. Stop. Um, YouTube.com slash SDPN. Yes. Yes. The Leafs versus, I believe, the still first place Vancouver Canucks. Are wow. Division? Yes. In the divi no, who's in the NHL? It's the Jets. Uh, the Jets should still be. That's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, tell you in half a second. Unbelievable. Jets from the uh, enormous market of Winnipeg. Uh, by Jets way. by points percentage. They've played 43 games. They have 62 points. The Vancouver Canucks have played 44 games and also have 62 points. Okay. There you go. Hot diggity. The man. Colorado it's Avalanche. It's going to be a great stream. Who have one line. And that's it. Have 61 points and sit fourth in league standings. The Boston Bruins, with the back of great goaltending once again, are in third overall. In league the Bruins standings. on paper make me want to just fall to my knees and cry. Uh, their second line, according to Daily Faceoff, is Danton Heinen, Pavel Zaka, Jake DeBrusque. Better than the Leafs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just fed up. One thing I really <laughs> love fed up. about the NHL season this year is that you have different teams being successful at different styles. Mm -hmm. The Winnipeg Jets are doing it all with defense. The the Vancouver Canucks are doing it a lot with offense. The Boston Bruins are doing it with great shutdown, just overall play, plus great goaltending. Yep. The Colorado Avalanche are just willing their way with Nathan McKinnon taking over in one line. It's been very fun to watch this season because yep. you have these different styles being successful in different ways. Turns out it's important to have an identity. I, I want to... Um, I, I want to talk about this. Um, we talked about Stamkos on Monday, and it was super weird, the timing of it, but Julian Brisewaugh basically talked to the media either Monday night or Tuesday and was like, hey, uh, we're not trading Stamkos in season. Um, it's not going to happen. 
And I was like, it was weird, weird to me because I don't, I'm not suggesting Julian Breeze was listening to this show. But what I'm saying is <laughs> I am. I don't think that I'd heard Steven Stamkos name out there in trade rumors and lightning are going to make the playoffs. We know that. Why did they feel the need to say that? And we don't know that. Well, they come on. They're probably going to make the playoffs. We don't know that. Betting betting odds. I would take the lightning to make it overnight. No, they've already blown it in their games against the Leafs. And now Detroit has games remaining and the Leafs are more than happy to be like, here, you take it. Um, the reason Julian Breezewell spoke to the media is he has a mid-season um, meeting with the media, media availability okay. every year. So that that was... I guess I guess yeah. somebody would have asked him that question. Yeah, then. so he, he, he had a press conference. Okay, because yeah, I was just so like... In there. I was like, yeah, I don't think anybody thought you were going to trade Steven Stamkos. No, no, it was it was in the his midseason and media availability. Somebody obviously asked the question of, hey, what's going on with Stammer? The one thing I'm wondering about with that is Stamkos has not been good at five on five this year. No, he's been brutal, brutal, brutal. Um, Put up a bunch of points, but like you said, he's been getting well caved he, in. He's on a line with Kucherov, so. Uh, but I, but I would also say this can't be a minus player. I'd also, yeah, no, you can't. I, I would also say this if if Stamkos has a bad year. Does that not help the Lightning retain him? Because <laughs> his price no. goes down. Nah, if if you're Steven Stamkos, you go uh, Google me and uh, you. Know, Adam's not wrong. Move off. Your I I think it's actually. I think this is helping bring the two sides together. If he I, fell off the map completely, of course it'd be easier to like, sign yeah, him. Yeah, what are but, you signing him for <laughs> next year? Like seven million? Those arguments generally don't work with first ballot Hall of Famers. <laughs> okay. Like uh, generally, right, then you are correct. <laughs> generally, you're correct. All right, like, okay, see, see, do you like living in Tampa? Cool. This is the number. It's not nine million anymore. Not not based on this season. And that's how they're gonna they're gonna judge it. Oh, but I got a point a game. Yeah, but you played with Nikita Kucherov, who led the league in scoring. Yeah, but I helped him. Yeah, but really, did you? Because you had a minus twenty, which is goofy. I have five that five stinks. I have that discussion with Julian Breeze while I go to Florida and side for league men. Okay, prove a point. <laughs> All right. I'd be like, good, good. Have fun. Yeah. Uh, I think Julian Brisewa is smart enough to figure out a future without Steven Stamkos. I think, I think that Stamkos wants to stay in Tampa more than Tampa wants him to stay. And it's oh, not because 100%. it's not because they don't want him to stay. Yep. It's because they're like, no, we have a team to run. No, and I, I and I like and respect yeah. this because it's not about doing right by your guy. No, it's about doing right by the team. I, uh, by the way, I agree with you. Okay. That um, the Lightning should explore moving on from him i agree that they should not overpay him i'm just saying like don't try to tell me i'm something i'm not i'm steven stamkos yeah and if i'm julian breeze why i go here's how we value you yeah it, it if they have to walk away i think he'd do it i think they would do it i think the lightning would do it yep. too it's, yep. It certainly seems no, no, like... No, no, that's what I meant. Like, Bruce oh, Yeah, and I think... I, I don't think Stamkos wants to leave. And I think ultimately the Lightning would like to keep him. How could you not? I also, though, wonder... Are we getting to the point where this is not his team anymore? And and I think we haven't seen it in the NHL as much. And I've suggested it in Toronto a couple of times. Um, captains who... we only I think I've only really seen it work in San Jose because they've been the only ones that tried it. But, you know, Marlowe got stripped... Thornton got stripped. Everybody survived. They all stayed on the team. And I wonder if um, I wonder if we start to see teams go, okay, but this isn't your team anymore. So we are going to take the the captaincy away from you and give it to somebody else. You, and you're signing it less. Who do you give it to? Kucherov. Kucherov, eh? I mean, the guy's going to win. If, if this keeps up, and McDavid could catch him because he's McDavid. But let's say this keeps up and who draws first and McDavid second. And he's the Art Ross trophy winner. He beats out McDavid. Well, whose team uh, is it? Yeah, but is it's, it it's about the team? dynamics in the room. Is it Victor right? Hedman's team? It's not about it's the captaincy isn't really a, a points race, right? Fair, yeah. But it's got to be one of your better. Players. I would say no. Hedman. Um, okay, that's because fine. because that's fine. what what did we say about the Lightning? Well, the, these last few years in the playoffs. They are the best politicians in the NHL. Fabulous. They are yes. the best campaigners to the officials. They are the best at going up to the guys wearing black and white and saying, my fellow Americans. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's what Victor Hedman always says, my fellow Americans. Thank you for your question. Yes. Thank, <laughs> thank you. And it's and it's great that it's, you're right as an American to ask that that's question. Such Isn't a freedom staple. wonderful? It's a great staple. <laughs> Um, I would, I would give it to Hedman because, uh, I think, I just think he's better at that. Mm -hmm. Whereas Kucherov, 
just sees the red mist a little too often. Okay, fair enough. I'm just wondering if that's going where we're going. Back to the Breezewa Stamkos thing. I thought the quotes on it were really fascinating because he said before the season that he's not negotiating in season, like it's not happening. And then during the press conference, his media availability, he doubled down and he said, um, asked if it, he envisioned Stamkos being a lightning beyond the season. Breezewa said, yes, talks won't continue until the summer. After the season, we're going to sit down and evaluate where we are as a team and where Steven is and see how we can make all those parts come together. I don't know why he's so adamant about that. Why? Because I think he's establishing dominance. He's telling Steven, your era of being the guy is over. Mm -hmm. I am now the guy. And if you would like to remain a part of the team, you will come to me, Julian Brisewa, the guy. Is that a good way to run your team? Yeah. Treating the guy whose jersey is going to be retired like this? Look at Vegas. Look at Vegas. Look what I, they, they, don't, they don't have a Steven Stamkos. They did. They, they have a him. cup. They traded him. His name was Marc Andre Fleury. No, he, he wasn't, he wasn't there. It's not. He the wasn't name, Steven Stamkos. But he was the most popular player uh, on the team for the years. That I th there. I think it's a little different. I think I think they're in, I think he's playing a little, with a little bit of fire here, and he's trying to anger the captain of the so, team, and the guy's gonna could have a statue. The, I think he's the, trying to establish dominance. The Lightning are definitely challenging their guys mm -hmm. like i think this is a top-down organizational strategy mm -hmm. and also like i don't think he does this if he's not legitimately willing to walk away i think he is i think he is too oh yeah and i think he's i think he's playing cat and mouse and and i actually sort of as a leaf fan who you know our team never does that mm -hmm. uh, i respect it i respect yeah. it i also have a ton of respect for steven samkos and all the things that he's brought to tampa mm -hmm. i mean when he was the when when they were bad he was the light. He was, he's the, all roads went through him. And remember the year that he was injured, they didn't even make the playoffs. And like 15, 16 or something like that. And got, I think, Victor Hedman. No, 16, 17. Or was it Sergachev? They got uh, Sergachev that year? Uh, uh, was that the Sergachev year? There's a bunch. No, of not the Sergachev. I mean, and then Sergachev was a trade, yeah. yeah. Every year they just fucking hit. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I love, uh, now, I don't know if you saw this last night. We're running a little short on some of the hockey stuff because we have a very uh, we have a special guest named Terry Ryan coming Woo! up. Uh, I just wanted to quickly touch on a couple things. Senators, it was 4-2. It ended 7-2. The Senators under Jacques Martin have not been a whole lot. Not in favor of the Senators. Not in favor of the Senators. Yeah. Right. The Colorado Avalanche. Good at coming back. They're the I think they've come back the most times in the NHL this year and making won. me uh, regret not picking up Juice Sanunen and, and, uh, and fantasy. <laughs> I almost uh, did. They are, uh, they're bad and it doesn't matter. It's, it seems now it doesn't even matter that Jacques Martin is in there like instilling, you know, his, his discipline or whatever it's supposed to be. This team stinks. Well, this team's bad. You, you see it happen where you're like, okay, this team is on the verge of a blow up mm -hmm. and they fire their coach. Mm -hmm. Then the ship gets righted and it's just steady as she goes. That's what Vancouver did. That's what Edmonton has done. Um, Lots of teams over the years have done it. In the situations where you fire the coach and it gets worse, that's when it's off with their heads. And I think that's going to happen in Ottawa, man. Like, it's not just going to be the easy guys to trade. Like, when we had Jason York on, we were talking about, like, Kubelik and, and uh, Tarasenko. He's like, well, yeah. But then the conversation goes to like, okay, what Shabbat. about what about Shabbat? I man, a couple years ago, I couldn't imagine him being in this conversation. They were playing him half an hour a night, and he was succeeding. He was the only like watchable thing about the team for some games, and now they're talking about trading him. Mm -hmm. Things are bad. They're bad. And Michael Anlauer, by the way, um, I'm not sure if you read this. I got this quote sent to me. Uh, but um, Michael Anlauer is extremely competitive. I was asking somebody about him. Um, and here is the quote that I thought you might find interesting. He said, don't get me wrong. I had a really great 13 or 14 year relationship with Jeff, as in Jeff Molson and his partnership with the Montreal Canadiens. You remember Michael Anlauer mm -hmm. was a 10% shareholder of the Montreal Canadiens for like 15 years. He said, uh, um, he said that collaboration still together. It's been collaborative, but my desire is, to be a part owner was of the Montreal Canadiens was to really win a Stanley Cup. And I didn't feel like I had that alignment. And I'm not going to go into details. Jeff has the last say, and I respect it. I was there for him when he needed me. And there were times of frustration. I play to win. 
I think <laughs> Steve Steos can attest to that uh, because he's been with me a lot of my hockey career. He wanted to be the guy. I think he also... I mean, I think there was an insinuation that perhaps the Montreal Canadiens are more interested in in making money than winning, um, which as Lee fans, we can relate to. But Michael <laughs> Antlauer is not going to sit or it doesn't matter that you were a part of someone else's core. This guy doesn't give a shit. If I was a Senators fan, as depressing as it is right now, I would be so excited for the next 24 months. It's rare that you see an owner this involved and this mad. Oh, he's pissed. You see him after, during every game, they shoot his box with Steven, Steve Steos. And does he look happy? Oh, he looks quite pissed. His shoulders are, are past his ears. He's just... Oh, yeah. Like, he's got no neck anymore. This is a tall man. He's going to have a strong jaw and no teeth by the end of the season. He is <laughs> really? just clenched <laughs> at all like, times. He's going to be Giga Chad. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to say that today, uh, uh, Cody Hodgson uh, signed with the Milwaukee Admirals. Which hey, is the last woo. team he played with, that's a PTO, 25 games. So good for him. That's, that's a, cool. An AHL start for Cody Hodgson. Good for him. Awesome. And I quickly want to hit this too. Um, this is the business side of things. You probably don't care as much, but Diamond Sports and Amazon have agreed to an investment and debt restructuring. What Jeff does this Bezos. mean? Jeff, yeah, Jeffrey, <laughs> Jeffrey Bezos. Now, this means that uh, there's going to be like uh, 20 states that have their games broadcast on Amazon uh, for hockey, basketball. And of course, the NFL is already on Amazon. And I think it's really interesting because um, there have been executives in this country that believe that the streaming sites, the Amazons, the Apples, the Netflix is whatever. And Netflix hasn't done sports that do not believe that any of them would be interested in hockey in Canada. Hmm. And I'm saying, if you're in, if they're this interested in hockey in the states, you bet your ass they're interested in hockey in Canada. Oh yeah. And I think I I'm I don't know this. I don't have any sources on this, but I do think there's going to be some whopper offer, and hopefully all the rights go to one spot, and we can watch it all. When we want, with no regional blackouts, in a couple easy. years. Just make it easy. Just make it easy. How many sure. How many years left in the sports nut deal? I think it's the Rogers deal. Like this year, next year, and the year after. I think it's up in twenty six. It was a four. Oh. Wasn't it a twelve year deal? Wow. So it was. I think it was signed in twenty twelve or twenty thirteen. And it's a twelve year deal. That's uh, I. Mm, I think it was twenty twenty thirteen. I believe it was signed. The first twenty five is the end. I think first year of the contract was fourteen fifteen. Do you know how long it was? 12, 12 years. years. Well, there, there's your answer. So what is that? Uh, I guess there's 24, 20. No. <laughs> this year, I don't fucking know, man. I don't know. Don't make me do this. I think three years left. Adam, did you look it up? 12-year, $5.2 billion deal, which is bananas. Oh, my God. Uh, this is an article from November 26, 2013. So 14, 15 was when it started. That means it's 26 will be the end. 26, 27, I think. Which okay. is so we got a oh, we got a bit of a ways, but I'm excited for that. So 25, 26 is the last year. Yeah, actually. So that's not um, that's not too far off. <laughs> no, nope. we're 2024. It's not. It's not far at all. It is. I'm so excited to see how that that season goes up up until like when that's coming up and we mm -hmm. hear about all those negotiations and stuff like that as you said like a lot of people don't care about the business side but i think that'll be fascinating to watch i uh as someone who worked there for a very long time it's just it's disappointing to hear the tone in your voice um just oh hey you know hey that's soon good <laughs> well it just I don't know. After 12 years or something, I think we're all excited to see what next can happen yeah. with hockey I'm not, in Canada. Yeah. I'm not taking it personally. I'm not criticizing you. I'm just, it's, what a shame, you know, like no, we, I, we put in a lot of work. To, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's a shame at all. I think it's just, hey, exciting new thing can happen. Yeah. No, I, I don't, I don't think we're saying, oh, they did a bad job during the 12 years. It wasn't fun content. I'm, I'm just like, there's something new. That's I think, exciting. yeah, but are you excited for the new thing if the current thing was going well? I think either way, it's exciting because technology changes so fast. It's I agree. 12, That's true. 12 That's years true. from from when it started to when like, it's going to end, it's a new thing. I remember the presentation because uh, I was there when Keith Pelly gave it. Keith Pelly, now the head of MLSE. And he said, we are going to hit this on a five problem. We're going to do <laughs> I was radio. CBC. It was a depressing day. <laughs> We're going to do radio. We're going to do television. We're going to do digital. We're going to do magazine. 
And I forget what the fifth one was. I remember they had Sportsnet Magazine. Anyone have a su subscription to that? That's right, because it you, nobody got a subscription to it. Um, and for a while there, when they moved all the Sportsnet Magazine people over to Sportsnet.ca, to me, the best website in hockey was Sportsnet.ca. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I don't think, listen, I think it's fair to say that the NHL and Rodgers signed a deal that they both prefer would have gone differently. I don't say that to denigrate any of the people that signed the deal. I'm not denigrating the producers, the on-air talent, anybody. We know people over there. They're great people. What's your problem? But I do think that there are things that they'd wish had gone differently. A pandemic in the middle of it. A uh, declining ad market. Uh, all the other shit that's gone wrong. Underratedly for forgotten. The first year. Oh, for seven on Canadian. Yeah, teams. no Canadian teams in the playoffs. Making the playoffs. Yeah. Like, yeah, like it's uh, that sucks. That sucks. So I think, I think I'm with you, Jesse. I think the the excitement of technology. I've watched the Blue Jays on Apple TV. Yeah, the the world is now. America watched 23 million Americans watched NFL football on Sunday on Peacock. Which was the Chiefs game, right? They put the Chiefs game yeah, on Peacock. Yeah, they put the Chiefs game on That's Peacock. the Taylor Swift effect. And everybody, like, like, now I got to subscribe. 23 to million people did that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, uh, the technology is changing so fast that there's so many other things we can do with this. these broadcasts. That's going to be fun to see. Wait, the what effect? The Taylor, <laughs> Taylor Swift, Swift effect? Yeah. Oh. I just get so mad. There's a lady watching football. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, I just get so mad. She might even love a guy on the field. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Keep her Gosh, away. I've had it up to she, here. She's 10 times more famous than he is. Ooh. Yeah, no, but she's using the tight end of the Chiefs. Yes, as, as, a, <laughs> as a proper. You're not talking to the mic, Adam. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, go. I took my headphones off. Yeah, no, it's. No. <laughs> Your voice, okay. Terry. I believe Your we have Terry. an interview to get to. Let's get Terry Ryan on. Let's go. I can count on one hand the amount of active professional hockey players we have had on this show. We did not. We we didn't build this show getting guests because we nope. couldn't get any. No. Nope. Uh, and we still oftentimes struggle. But we have today a professional hockey player on the show under contract with the Newfoundland Growlers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's Terry Ryan. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's an honor to be here. I do follow along, by the way. I watch every LFR, but I do watch your your uh, show quite frequently. I know what's going on, and I really appreciate being here. Oh, we, we, we love having you. Terry. I'll e-transfer you that 20 bucks. Yeah, that's great. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Terry, you got to get on Cameo. You're perfect at this. Um, oh, I am. Oh, you are? Okay. Oh, oh, you I've been on oh. Ever since Teddy Hitchcock making a, made an appearance in my life, I figured I'd I'd go that route. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, active on there. Unreal. Um, so, I, uh, Terry, we got to start with the start, which is you're 47 years old. You're playing <laughs> mm. professional hockey. You're fighting people. Um, <laughs> yeah. How has the last week been? You've been, you've done the media rounds. Everybody wants a piece of you right now. Your press conference afterwards was incredible. How do you feel right now in this moment? Ooh, it's a lot to unpack. The first thing, um, content, a contentment that I never, ever felt as, look, this was, I was content in my life, okay? But I really didn't retire on my own terms. I made some bad decisions. I was a good hockey player. I, I was I was a first round pick. I was more than a good hockey player, and I didn't play my cards right. And unfortunately, there are no time machines. But I learned my lessons, and it was too late. And I did put out a book ten years ago. Now seems like two tales of a first round nothing. And I could I could look at it tongue in cheek, and you know because I did get to play for the Canadians. Um, a lot of my friends are six feet under. A lot of my friends got hurt before their first NHL game. A lot of friends never got a chance for one reason or another, even to get drafted, and they were good enough. So. I understand now more and the more time that passed since my last pro game, I, I became more appreciative of being a Montreal Canadian. And, um, you know, it was on me. There was a situation without getting right into it. I thought I should play maybe. And I, I didn't like my coach in the minors, Michelle Tyrion. But, you know, I, I didn't really ever go in and try to communicate with him either. He was a rookie coach. I was a rookie player. And, um, you know, I was immature to a level. I didn't want to go back to camp. And while I was holding out, uh, I ended up hurting my ankle, and I never did get back. I shot it with cortisone for, for the better part of three years. I played in my three favorite minor league cities, Boise, Idaho, Orlando, Florida, and Cincinnati, um, Ohio. And I, I realized that 
it was over. I couldn't get out of the way anymore. I didn't have a step to lose when it came to skating. And I, I, I'm a winger and I would, I took pride in being able to get the puck out and take the hit, but now I was getting crushed. I, I didn't even be able to see the hit. So I, I, I just was a sitting duck out there. I realized I didn't have a step to lose. I'd never get back. Like I said, I wasn't a great skater to begin with. So I know it's a long way to answer your question, but this is this is where I'm coming from. As there's 47, and then there's 21 years away from the game. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the pro game. I, I I always got my finger on the pulse. I've been playing senior hockey uh, regularly. I mean, until a couple of years ago, and we take it serious here. We want to go. The Allen Cup is the national ch senior championship, yep. and um, we take pride in that. Now, the, the 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 deadline here is when you're in January 10th. So I'll get in that in a second. But that's the reason that I was allowed to play. Not allowed to, but why the stars aligned. Because you couldn't pl pluck anybody from senior after January 10th. And there's six teams worth of guys that came back from pro or major junior or whatever playing college. You know, so there's lots of eligible players on January 9th. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, for me, I guess I'd come to terms with my decision and my mistakes as a kid because over time people here embraced me as a local amateur player that once had a had a cup of coffee in the nhl there was i think a little bit of a cloud over all those senior games no one really ever came out and said like you're a bum i mean they did i guess chirping at me but most newfoundlanders were really supportive but i mean my jersey was retired i had the key to the city and you know, I, I, I always felt like, you know, people knew, like, you know, everything from like, Terry, what the hell? Uh, mm -hmm. to like, you know, man, giving me a hug. I, I wish things could have worked out different. And after a while, I was like, I get it. There's pity there. But I did play on the Montreal Canadiens and I took pride in that. I became part of the Canadian national ball hockey team for years. We just won the world championship in September in the master's division, 34 plus. Uh, but because I could run fine always, I just couldn't skate. It restricted my skating, the high ankle sprain. So all of these things are part of my, my, my mental being now. I can't really, you know, it's part of my subconscious, but at this point, I love it. I go down to the growlers games. I wish until a few days ago that I could have retired on my own terms, but I didn't get to. And that's the way it goes until now. <laughs> and what was wild about this and maybe I'll get into the circumstances of how unique this actually was in a second, but I don't mean to skip over so much, but just to tell you guys where I'm coming from, I've had a lot happen in my life. I, 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 I've been down. I've, I've been almost bankrupt a couple of times. Um, I've looked at my daughter and I was raising a kid. My, my buddy BJ Young passed away in 2006. We were going to go overseas and play together. I flew out and I did my best to raise his son, Tyson, who's now 24 years old. He lives in Hawaii. My daughter, Penny Lane, is here with me. I married BJ's ex and we got divorced. But so Penny Lane is, you know, a product of that. We're, we're really close. Even though we're divorced, we love each other. And she's only ever known love, but she's known me as a hockey player to tell these stories. Might come to see a senior game, might watch me play ball hockey, but we go to Growler's games we love the team i love the fact that we still have a professional team here steve i said i watch every lfr you're talking about prospects here and i mean i watch it all the time pretty much religiously i watch first up i listen to overdrive i watch you there's chicklets there's a bunch of of these hockey voices that are part of my life and you're one of them so this is a surreal that i get to go down there <laughs> and play with the leafs prospects the very ones that i often hear about and to absorb their 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 stories and to fire some back at them anyway i'm getting ahead of that even so people were there from the film world again my hockey career ended way earlier than i wanted it to the nhl wasn't the be all and end all i was a passionate player but i could have played overseas or whatever it just i couldn't couldn't make it happen I was stocking shelves with Red Bull here and there, um, you know, sometimes unemployed. I worked in factories for minimum wage at night, but I did whatever for, for whatever I could do. I went back to school in 2009. I got a folklore degree with an English minor. Um, it really helped me to write the book and things were changing. They were starting to change, think positive, but, you know, it didn't really do anything to get me a job. My buddy, Alan Hawko got me. He was played Jake Doyle on Republic of Doyle. He gets me a job on crew, jump how high. I was a locations guy. I was an AD for years. 
and I got into doing some stunting the whole while keeping in, uh, you know, with Jason Momoa's read my book. Uh -huh. So even when I was trying to get away from hockey and not think about it, I wrote the book and people kept coming to me about it, you know, and I was playing the senior hockey, like I said, but now my daughter who was born in 2010, now it's 2015. Now it's 2016. I did play with Clarenville. We went to the Allen cup. We lost to Dundas uh -huh. in 2000, I believe it was 16 in, in the final. Like I, so I have been in high pressure situations, I skate with the boys in the summer and everything. And the last thing I'll say to set up all this is that I'd come to terms with the Montreal thing. I told you I didn't get along with Michelle Therrien, but I never should have not gone to camp. That was stupid. Okay. And I didn't want to go back. I felt embarrassed for years because the fans there really loved me. I, I was the rookie of the year in the minors. I had 21 goals, 34 fights. I'm not a goon. I never started one. But at that point, there was at that era, there was a lot of reasons to jump in for your teammates. And we didn't, we weren't loaded with tough guys. Myself, guys like Aaron Asham, Darcy Harris, um, I could go on and on. But, you know, there was guys that was just part of it. We, we, we took pride in the fact we could score and we could fight. But all of that is a part of the past. But I'm saying to you that I did play with pride in Montreal. You might only see those eight games. When I was 96, 97, I was there for almost the full year. I played four, but I was there to practice and learn. So a lot of them were my idols, and I got to know them as peers. And lots of nice things happened in Montreal. If you were to look at hockey DB, it would think you would think that I had my back up against the organization, but I'm very aware that my decisions are the main reason that my career ended early. So it took me a while. And anyway, Ray Jean Houle, who was the GM at that point, who I guess I was kind of upset with because I thought I should play more. Um, you know, he's head of the alumni now and he gets us tickets. And my daughter went to her first game last year. And around this time, they beat the leaps in overtime. They had no business doing it. But it was a great game, and she got to see it, and Reggie shook her hand and gave her a hug and took her down to the alumni room. We watched the game with the Shorzy guys, Jarrett, Dolo, and uh, Shorzy, Dolo, and Goody, and um, being Jonathan Diaby, Andrew Anson, and Jarrett Kiso. And then uh, watched the third period with Gilbert Dion, one of my heroes growing up with a big Stanley Cup ring. So all of that was water under the bridge, but I still didn't get to retire on my own terms, did I? Right. Mm -hmm. So that was still somewhere up here. I have all these hockey adventures, but at this point I had a lot of other adventures. And when I came out for the game, I realized here's all these people together. It reminded me of the last shot of uh, big fish. If you've seen the movie, I'm not saying that I'm a big fish. I'm saying that all these, this guy told all these stories and all these people came together at his funeral. I believe it was for, you know, and, and from all walks of life that hadn't really met each other, that didn't really know if each other were real. Well, it was like that. It was like, you know, people from the film world and then people I went to kindergarten with that I haven't seen since grade seven. Um, uh, hockey teammates. There was people that flew in from Toronto that are Shorzy fans to see the game when they heard the news the night before. So there was this whole plethora of, of, of emotions because all these people from all my life were there to support me and, and, and share in this moment. And I got to be honest, the hockey playing going into it was kind of my first worry. I want to keep up and I don't want to embarrass, but it ended up being, how am I going to deal with this elephant in the room? They were chanting my name when I wasn't getting out there, but it wasn't, I didn't expect to get anything that Matt Cook started me. I thought that was it. And you know, the, the second period I was up at least twice, I think three times, but there were penalties and you know, we are we're only going to go so far with this or otherwise it's going to seem like a stunt, but he knew that I was serious if he wants me to play. And um, I didn't want it to look like a stunt, but I could have not gotten out there again. And when he put me out there, the place, you I mean, the roof nearly came off. And I'm looking around going, wow. Like I had 100 people there that had never been to a hockey game. Mm -hmm. I know them from like music trivia night. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> this yeah. now, I'm 47 and I've lived in St. John's for all this time, right? And it just became this huge celebration of... Uh, you know, just a unique thing that I got to share with them. Now, that might be the longest question <laughs> ever answered. And I don't even know if I answered your question because no, I don't did, remember Terry. what it was. You Terry, gave, you gave it to us. I, I have to ask. So <laughs> you, you wrote your book. Is there an audio book? Did you narrate it? No, there should be, though. I know I told them. So if ECW Press are listening or uh, Flanker Press here in Newfoundland, I said it from day one, right? Because I do have a podcast, yeah. so I do have that avenue to talk to listeners. And you know what it's like. Like people start to when when you get a listenership and they start to listen and you they, they appreciate it. And 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 I really would like to do that because I think in this day and age with less and less reading, I mean, I'd just as soon it be old school, but I get it. We're getting away from that. So 
I think you should. More authors should have their voices on tape. Right? I, agree. I listen to a lot Buddy, of. Yeah, I mean, you. I was gonna download it before I went home. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. If, if, if you if you recorded it, I could listen to you talk all day, Terry. Terry Shorty <laughs> obviously is a thing that you're involved with, and it it spawned off of Letter Kenny. The show did. Your mm. appearance on Letter Kenny led to you being on Shorty. Can you explain? Mm. For anybody that hasn't seen it, I know it's it's made it into hockey circles in the States. There's like a cult following with this show that is really special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, it's really funny because I just gotten in the acting union in 2016 and I was waiting or sorry, no, the film crew union. I'm in IATSE and I, I got in as a set dresser. Uh, you know, for those that don't know, you might go and we, we do it, I, shows I work on around here, Hudson and Rex. Um, it was Republic of Doyle at the time. And then there was this show Frontier and uh, that was Jason Momoa here in Newfoundland just a few years ago. It was awesome. But anyway, I, I, um, I was in crew, but they needed someone to play this British soldier that was beat up. And because really, I swear to you, I, I mean, I, I just, the year before I couldn't afford it, I, it would have cost everything to get my teeth fixed. So I was like, I know I'm going to get in the union in another like 300 days on set, whatever it was. So I'll just wait for them. And while I was waiting, Momoa happened to like my book, man. He happened to take, I had no idea. He's from Des Moines, Iowa. He follows hockey, plays roller hockey, but he'd never skated. So I took Momoa to, to the rink and pretty much taught him to skate. And he'd read my book. He loved it. So one thing led to another, and it was more Alan Hawko and the Take the Shot people here, which is a production company, because they had to okay it. But I'm the very first scene in Frontier, right? It caused for a British soldier um, to get his throat slit, fall down, whatever minor stunt. But Having the having the tooth out of my mouth looked pretty good for the part, and I started to get like other little things. I was working on crew, but hey, we need a boxer that gets beat up. Are you ready? That was uh, Little Dog, and then and they might say, "Hey, we need a gangster for this thing." And I, you're in the background, you got two lines. Do you mind doing it? I'm going. Do I mind doing it? I'm in a movie. What are you talking about? Of course. <laughs> now I'm starting to get the odd role. And Momoa took me to Europe for three months, gave me some stunts uh, in in Frontier season three. I'm in there a lot. We just kept changing my appearance. It was pretty funny, actually. I die like 17 times. <laughs> it's, it's true. It was wild. Um, and I know, again, I know you didn't ask me this, but I am getting there. So I was telling this story. I think it was on Chicklets, but it was on one of these mm -hmm. platforms when podcasts were right coming into their own, maybe, I guess, five, four or five years ago. Four. And um, Kiso, I believe... I never really asked him, but I, I I believe he was listening. I'm led to believe that. And casting called me. I was telling this story about getting the acting world and casting for Letter Kenny called and they said, do, do you, are you still missing that tooth? And I said, yeah, I am. And they said, well, here, can you go audition for this right away? And usually that never happened to me before. I never had anything to do with someone out of province seeking my services when it came to acting. Are you kidding? So, and then I heard it. I said, what do you want me to do? And they were like, well, it's this Newfoundlander that, you know, is getting up there in age that plays senior hockey. He got a smart mouth on him. He's got no tooth. He used to play pro hockey. He was a first round pick. I'm going, is this a joke? Is this a joke? You and like, really, I really did. Much like the call from Zach O'Brien to play for the Growlers. Like, because I mean, every actor, I know actors, man, that are great actors that don't get a chance to be in a show like this. Just like my book, man. It's great that the Habs let me use their symbol on the front. And I had avenues like podcasts, people like yourself and Ken Reed and Biz and that helped me to promote it. Uh, John Cherry, Ron McLean had me right in. I walked right on Hockey Night in Canada with my book, with my publicist from ECW. And she went, my God, I can't get you these gigs. <laughs> anyway, so the whole hockey world reached out back then. And so, you know, when, when, when that platform, you know, got bigger and especially when letter kenny happened now you, you know I, I i guess i came back here and i i didn't really know that shorzy was going to happen i had a bite to eat it was the last day guys of filming that i had the letter kenny gig which means we had rap party that day so we just it was basically just my scene we went out to a place called capriol went out shot it and it was great because i hadn't seen the guy that i'm talking about letter kenny now mm -hmm. Um, it's, I think it's season eight and it's towards the end, I believe. And I'm on a team called the George Streeters. And the whole gag was for us to come and to taunt the bench, right? Me. And so the other Newfoundlander, I wasn't going to know who it was. No one told me. I didn't even realize that it would be a Newfoundlander. I assumed it would be, but I mean, I'm just getting the lines, trying to remember them. I get there and it's not only a friend. I played a high level of hockey with both of his brothers. He left maybe... 20 years, like he left right out of high school. Patrick Cook was his name. 
But I'm looking at him. So Kiso said, look, here's the lines, but I've only been to Newfoundland one day. And he said, like, so if you have anything else to add, go ahead. You know, I want you to do it my way first, but I'm just going to leave the camera on and then you guys keep going. So I, I looked at Patrick. I'm like, okay, let's do Townie. I can do Townie. <laughs> There's different accents. I told Kiso because Kiso loves crack cold water cowboys. But like one of my first lines was center heist or something to do with that because people, a lot of people drop H's and add H's. Like Ed Hurley would be head early. Okay, head early over there. Right. So, and I'm like, that's, that's outside the overpass. That's around the bay. I can do it, but I'm going to have to think about it before the scenes and maybe change it a little bit. But I go, I can do Townie right now. If he wants me to be Ted Hitchcock like this, I can do it right now, my son. And he went, okay, that. And I said, okay. <laughs> that. I looked at, at Patrick Cook and I said, okay, man, let's just do Townie. I'm going to kind of go Monday Pond area. And he goes, I know exactly what you mean. So then we did it. And then we kind of bounced some of our own little lingo in there. And uh, anyway, Jared had lunch with me and said, I might have an idea for the future, which ended up being Shorzy. And that night was the rap party. And I went to it and I was so pumped to be even part of it because I watched Letterkenny and I was a fan. So again, this is much like the day with the Growlers. This is kind of my acting gig. I think it's going to end there, though. I'm like, this is unreal. I get to be on Letterkenny. I feel like the soup Nazi on uh, Seinfeld. You know what I mean? Like, where did that guy go after? I don't know. But he was on Seinfeld for a day. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah man. that's what I felt like. Yeah. Right. That's exactly what I felt like. So and I was pumped. So I went out. I got home at like 4 a.m. I missed my flight. Like I, they had to book me a new flight. I was like, oh, man, like and I didn't really, you know, you're hung over. You get anxiety. I'm like, I called Jarrett, but I was like, you know, I think I let him down. But apparently they loved it. They're like, yeah, he came out. Who cares? He missed his flight because I was doing the I was doing the tunes. There was a jukebox. We went back to a house party and it was really a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, that was 2019, I guess. And, and of course, not not that long after that. I got the phone call to uh you know to be ted hitchcock on shorzy and, and even then i didn't really know what was coming um to the level that it did but it really intrigued me and so i, I think you were referring to earlier about letter kenny and shorzy mm -hmm. and you know the the level of fandom that's out there and and you know it is people that it's a very quotable show and i think Jarrett writes it brilliantly even like little characters my character he gets it all in. He gets depth of characters within 18 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it is. I don't know how he does it. And he gives you uh, this little tink, right? Well, it's Ted, Ted Hitchcock. And if you say it fast and, and then there's the Martoonies, right? So these little things that help when you're doing cameo or help when you're, mm -hmm. when you're yeah. doing a public appearance or, you know, yeah. we, we want the guy that drinks the Martoonies and yeah. right. And, and, and everything that he writes puts a smile on people's faces. So he finds a way to really connect with hockey audiences, purists, and not non-hockey audiences. He's got, you know, there's a lot of minorities represented in the show. Um, women are running the league. The way that he's done it is he's made it very 2024. And I think much like, say, the Family Guy or the Simpsons, mm -hmm. Shorzy, which I didn't know going into this, Shorzy, the, the, he's almost... He's crude like Archie Bunker. There, there's a there's a soul to him, and there's a depth to the characters. But even though they might be a little crude and off the wall, you you almost want to cheer for him, you know. And well, you do. And when I was reading it, I thought it was absolutely brilliant as as it went on. And I said, "Wow, this is I can't believe I'm going to be part of this." I hope people watch. And man, people have really, I think for that reason, a lot of people identify with it. And it's not, it it's so hockey centric without being absolutely all about hockey. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Terry. When I saw your uh, your post game press conference from the game the other day got posted, I thought three things. One, God, that's amazing. Number two, God, I can't wait to listen to this. And number three, thirteen minutes. <laughs> 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 I saw the thing go up. I'm like, a post game interview, of thirteen minutes. We're lucky to get ninety seconds out of the least. No, this this is unreal, uh, Terry. And uh, I mean, I don't know how you can be unfamiliar with you before the show and and not be totally in love with you by now um i i just wanted to know um because like i there are mornings where i get out of bed and i'm like my foot's not bending properly you're 47 and, and played a, a game in the echl and got into a fight like 48 yeah. hours ago how you feeling actually i feel i, I do feel good guys I'm, I'm not gonna lie i'm not trying to be a hero but I do. I skate a lot. I skate five times a week. And like I said, it's it's the Masters team, but I play on the Canadian ball hockey, you know, the, the national team. 
over 34 teams. So, you know, I stay active. Now, my worry was, am I going to be able to keep up with the play? I, I, I knew that my cardio would take me so far, but my legs still got to work like they used to, or at least some shadow of that otherwise. And after I got out there for the first shift, I knew that. And I was, it was kind of like, um, I'd say riding a bike, but it was almost like riding a roller coaster because there was a lot of adrenaline involved. I got off on all the plays I was making. You know, I'm like, and, and I know these guys, Todd Skirving, um, mm-hmm. Jordan Escott and Zach O'Brien, Jordan, uh, jo- uh, James Melendi, the guy I, I picked up for when I fought, Adam Daw. These are guys I skate with all the time. Jordan and Zach have been at uh, national championships. I speak about ball hockey world championships with me. Like, you know, we, we've been in tense situations, right? We've we've got six silver national championship or <laughs> medals. We never won the the gold when it came to um with those guys in ball hockey, but we got a great provincial team and I've played with it. I watched them play from day one when they were 10. So, and now that, you know, they're adults, Zach's 31. He's a good friend of mine. So I, that was the mentality going in. Like, you know, before the game guys, I don't want to be a sideshow. I'm going to be to some degree. There's going to be an elephant in this room, the entire game. But here's the thing, guys, look, I got in the fight. I, understand the game is changing and I have no problem with that. And a lot of people, I guess, you know, I prefer the fighting in. That's just the way I, I was brought up with it. I get that we're getting away from that. But the other thing is how far are we getting from that? I saw Bill Burr somewhere interviewed and he said, you know, there's still like 250 plus fights in the NHL every year. Like other sports must look at us and go, are these guys not saying that they're curbing fighting? You know, like <laughs> yeah, there, there's still lots of them. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> there, there's still all kinds of fights. Oh, and yeah. You know, from my perspective, you know, at some point it might be gone. But look, I like it because I experienced it. And I think it's a way often to show you passion. I can't make myself go. Not that I was thinking that going into it. I thought this when I was 14. When I first played junior. I was the youngest junior player in Canada. And I had to learn quick when to fight, when not to fight. What's it, what it's all about. Why is physicality in hockey? So I'll explain it like this. Like I tried to explain to my daughter. I said, you know why I fought there, right? Like you understand that. And you understand why the people cheer. Because if I fought in the first period for no reason and I lose that fight, now I'm not doing the team a very big favor at all. I'm being anti-team. Yep. I get called in for one game and I'm going to put on a circus and all of a sudden lose. And these guys who I respect that we come down and watch every game. Now, all of a sudden I'm putting them in a hard position. That wouldn't be a very way, a, a nice way to leave this team, would it? So I said, you understand why I fought? And in the history of hockey, she plays soccer on the provincial team, a great soccer team, a great soccer player. I said, you know, fighting is not in your sport, and it's not a part of it, and it shouldn't be. But in hockey, there seems to be some level of agreement over the years. It's There's still a level of respect involved, and there's a time to do it and a time not to, which is why I fought in the first place, but it's also why me and Zach Walker shook hands after the game. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. And I said, it's still there. So that's the reason that I did that. And I had to go back and like, you know, over, over time, I've been kind of showing her the YouTube and, and explaining to her because fights last on YouTube and a lot of goals don't. That's why I'm glad. Shout out if anybody's listening to this from the Western Hockey League. They put out a little highlight tape of some of my goals back then and they didn't add any fights and it's fine. I had lots of them, but sometimes because fights last so long, people remember me as that and you know it's fine but i did have 50 goals in my draft year which isn't an easy feat no. um and you know in in my last year in red deer i got sent back and i had 18 goals in 16 playoff games which is still a record so i, I could score and i think sometimes people forget that and it's fine because i don't want to be have some level of vanity attached to the accomplishments but it's nice sometimes for people to be reminded of that because you know in my mind, I was always out there. When I got onto the ice, it was to take the puck and to put it into the net. It was never the other thing, but I was a good teammate. Now, guys, to finish this, another long-winded answer. I, I, when I jumped onto the ice, Zach Walker had just hit. Now, I was playing regular in the third period, right? So I started the game, which was nice. The third, If he didn't put me out there again, I mean, it's Matt Cook, too, a guy that you know I, I, I look at and you know I know he's suspended a little bit, but he plays with passion. I have more in common with Matt Cook than not. I wasn't dirty out there or anything. I think anybody playing, it, I dropped my gloves, but I wouldn't really take many suspensions. And I know Matt did that, but you know, I think also some of his passion is misunderstood. He played all those games and he's remembered for a few suspensions. I see a lot of myself in that guy, right? He's a forward. We came, came into the NHL around the same time, a couple years after me. So it was, honor to be, it was an honor to be coached by him. But he put me out there. He didn't have to. I was getting a regular shift in the third 
And when I jumped over the boards and I saw James Malindi, who's been the captain here, said the Growlers won the championship in 19, their first year, 18, 19. He was the captain. Um, he plays now. He's a firefighter and he still plays home games. He loves hockey. He's as much of a story as I am. It's just that it was my night that particular night. But James is a great person, a great player. I watched him since he's 10 years old, and I hang out with him sometimes in the off season. and I love the guy. And I watched him, and I looked down, and I saw that his helmet was popped off. It's 6-2. to two. It's the third period. I swear to you, I swear to you, no level of me was putting on a show for the crowd. It just took over. There was a level of temper there that, you know, that, that happened. I, I, I know sometimes it might go over the top. In Matt's case, when he got suspended, in my case, I remember, you know, chirping a ref or something. But whatever it is, I believe that part of that passion, if you harness it the right way, that's part of the reason I got drafted in the first place. And for a snippet of time, I was those guys' teammate, and every fan in the building knew why I did it. My daughter could see it. It wasn't just going out to be a donkey. There's still a place for it, and there's still a place to show people what it's like to be a teammate. And I wasn't thinking it at the time, but I don't think it can hurt. Everything had to go right. I mean, I wish I did better in the fight, but I got a few in and I showed what I was willing. And sometimes it's about showing up. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, I do. My good friend, Dave Roper is a equipment manager with the leaps. And I, he's from Mount Pearl, one of my best friends in the world. I would like nothing more than to see them win. And if I rubbed off anything, if, if sorry, if something at all, all rubbed off and just how to be a competitor or, you know, I was willing to do it because I do believe that willing to be a teammate really goes a long way. You know, I, again, I wasn't thinking this going in, but I'm telling you that my instinct took over to, to get into that fight. And it was as if, you know, it was the late nineties again. So, you know, I was a hockey player. That's what I am. What happens when you're a hockey player? Um, <laughs> you, 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 you know, in your head, you're always the same age. Are you thinking age when you're out there playing Shinny? Not at all, right? Mm -hmm. To me, it's one of the things that takes your mind off of everything. When I was going through a divorce, when I was nearly bankrupt, all those things, if I went out and played Shinny for that little snippet of time, I don't, I don't think about any of that. And I can't think much. I like listening to the Beatles second. That would be my next best way to release nervous tension. But even then, my mind can wander a bit. But when I'm skating around and I'm trying to make plays and I'm with my buddies and I'm coming off the ice and I'm thinking about watching that play and talk, telling stories on the bench, could be Shinny, could be pond hockey, could be the East Coast League, but it takes your mind off stuff. Um, you know, it's 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 a it's, hockey is, is 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 so great for so many levels. Okay, and when I was out there, I was in that hockey. My own, I was in a time capsule that took me back to when I was playing pro in the first place. And one of the reasons is because that kind of passion exists in my brain. And I, you know, I, I chased down Walker. I did, and I and I and I fought him because. My player just got tattooed by him. Now, it turns out it was a pretty clean hit, but it didn't look like it to me. And you don't have time to really think about that. And I'm glad it happened. Now, like I said, what, what can I do here? Um, what are the positives? Because a lot of negatives could have happened or a lot of it could have been a nice little package that game. But it. The fact that Matt Cook, Adam Party, the rest of the team were cool that I mean, I'm getting every shift I get, there's a prospect not getting a shift. Some people put, could have put their back up and they would have been very justified in doing it. But I think in between, we really, you know, I knew, again, five of the guys are my real good friends and one of the coaches. So we and half the building. So we really vibed in the room as much as we could before the game. And, you know, I was a teammate. I was an accepted teammate by the third period. You know, it's wild how hockey works that way. And if anything that I hope that the boys can take from this, not that I was looking to have a teaching moment, I'm not trying to preach. There's a lot of that going on, and I'm not one that needs to be doing it. I'm no hero. I'm no nothing. But I am a hockey player. I don't care if I'm 47 or I'm 17, right? And those guys saw one of the reasons I was drafted was passion for the game, okay? I'm trying to be objective about it, and that that's true. I'm in, in no way trying to be boastful. That's true. So if that's something that might be lacking a little bit in today's game. I don't know, at least from a Canadian point of view, sometimes we talk about it a lot, at least in the media. Then if one player, you know, took something from that and they don't have the fight, go into the corner. Peter Forsberg is one of the toughest players I ever saw play the game with Absolutely. my own eyes. He never fought, yep. right? He just, but he'd, he'd go everywhere. He'd go, he'd, Steve Eiserman, how tough was that guy? Take a shot in the face, come back, win a cup, play on the fourth line, take a pay cut. 
right? I think we need more of that stuff, that team on and off the ice kind of atmosphere now. Now, that's what I think. Am I right? I don't know. But if I am, then some of those kids learned something and I can go away content with that and with the way that my hometown fans embrace me. My family finally got to see me go out the, the, the right way and not every hockey player is so lucky. Terry, beautifully said, and and we it's yeah. been a joy talking to you. Mm-hmm. Can you give your podcast a quick plug here? So if anybody wants to listen, how would they find it? Uh, sure. It's on most platforms. It's under the uh, umbrella of the Hockey Podcast Network. Uh, it's called Tales with TR. And uh, I just said, speaking of passion for the game, I had Darren McCarty on last week. That was a wild one even for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I just try to get, I do two a week, one, my, one on my own, um, which I did right before this, and uh, usually Tuesday or Wednesday and then Friday or Saturday, I have a guest on and it's usually someone I came across, you know, I mean, I'm interested in having big stars, but on there and, you know, people that might, a lot of, a lot of fans might want to listen to, but it's usually, I make a little rule in my head, someone that I came across in the game. And as, as these stories keep, keep being told, I'm coming across more and more people. Rick Vive called me. I was talking to him for an hour on Monday and I'd met Rick at a charity event. We're not best friends or anything, but you know what I mean? Uh, Mm -hmm. Jeremy Roenick reached out. I'm going on his pod. I mean, I only met him once in my life. I looked up to him, talk about passion for the game again. Right. So these things are, and you know, he agreed to come on. So my podcast is really, it's kind of um, it, it's usually a one on one with a friend or a acquaintance that I've come across through the game and not always musicians or sorry, hockey players, sometimes musicians or the like. Jim Cuddy wrote the forward to my book. Tales of there's another one. Tales of a first round. Nothing. Um, we share a lot of the same opinions on life, the, the same worldviews. We're really good friends. We like the same music. So, so I, I think. Look, and, and, and that's the books. So my second book is called uh, Fights, Film, and Folklore, if you want to look for it, Flanker Press. First one, Tales of a First Round Nothing. But here, the thing is, I'll, I'll leave you with, um, is in my book, Tales of a First Round Nothing is about a kid growing up, okay? It takes you to about 2014. I had a great story, or a, a great bunch of adventures to tell, to talk about. But each one on its own is an anecdote, and a lot of them are funny things that happened to a kid grow, growing up. But if you didn't read the whole thing, if you just heard me tell a story or two on Spit and Chicklets, you won't get the idea of the whole book. Mm-hmm. And the idea that I say at the very beginning and I repeat it at the end is that hockey's a beautiful game, right? We, a dressing room is a microcosm. It's a metaphor for real life. Leaders in a dressing room are going to end up being leaders in real life, chances are, right? Even the people that we look at and, you know, sometimes people, you're talking about Toronto, they might question a guy like Austin Matthews. Well, I'll tell you this, like sometimes the Leafs have been known to slump. When I saw him score last year in the playoffs and he went by the bench with some of the most joy that I've ever seen a hockey player have, you wouldn't have that built up inside if you didn't have passion for the game. Now, as you get older and more experienced, you might change the way you approach the game and other things might rub on off on you like it did Alex Ovechkin and the Washington Capitals after a bunch of years, the better part of a decade. But I do think, I don't think the leaps are far gone that you asked me about it, but I'm telling you because I do think the older you get within the game, it, a, a dressing room is a microcosm for real life. And those players now, whether they win the Stanley Cup or not, they're going to be successful afterwards. Guy like Marner just, just just signed that contract. You know what I said? Well, you know, you can argue the money if you want, but there's not everybody that embraces playing with that limelight. That does it, that does it so coolly wearing a tank top and chewing a toothpick kind of thing, right? <laughs> and I, if I was Willie. in Toronto, that would mean a lot to me, yeah. right? And there's a guy that's growing up a lot, yep. right? He's growing up, and he's growing up in a dressing room. And they're all going to be fine after hockey. Let's hope they win the cup one day. Yes. Oh, yeah. But yes. I just yep. think that hockey builds builds leaders in life. Well, Terry, uh, it's been such a pleasure having you on. We hope it's not the last time. And when you're in Toronto, you got to make sure you stop in, okay? Well, I... Just found out this morning I'm taking my dad up to the All-Star game. So if you guys hey, are there, shoot me a note. You got to come by. Yeah, We're shoot doing a whole bunch note. of events I, that we haven't announced yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, guys, I have no plan whatsoever. I said, you know what? After the game, I got a few opportunities to do some uh, do some appearances that weren't there before the game. And I, the least I could do, my dad's 71. He loves it. And we've had a chance to be on the same kind of hockey ride the last few years, and I want to take him. So Mm -hmm. I said, screw it. I booked a plane ticket. Nothing else is planned. So shoot me a note if you'd like, and I'd love to hang out on the weekend. That's awesome, Terry. Thanks, sir. No problem. See you guys soon. The Steve Dangle Podcast.
podcast. Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle, at Adam W-Y-L-D-E, and at Jesse Blake. Connection complete.